Oh, perfect. Uh, uh, for whatever reason, my, my slides were changing. Okay, so uh, in the past several years, there's been growing interest among atomic physics experimental groups to look for the possible transient signatures of macroscopic dark objects, uh, if such dark objects were to pass through the Earth. The basic idea is that if we strategically use a terrestrial network of detectors, which are spatially separated and ideally positioned on a number of different continents, then it may be possible to look for the correlated signatures of these passing dark objects. And in many ways, this would be similar to uh, searches for gravitational waves using laser interferometers like LIGO, Virgo, or G600. Except what we expect in this case is that these dark objects uh, should be massive, and therefore they, uh, they're expected to propagate at a subliminal velocity uh, rather than at the speed of light, which would be the case for gravitational waves. The simplest type of dark object we can have is a topological domain wall. And the, the simplest model which can accommodate such objects consists of a single real scalar field phi, which has a single degree of freedom. And in this case, there is a self potential here, which is uh, quartic, like the one in red here. So the shape of this potential is like the one in the graph below here. And we see that in this case, there will be two energetically equivalent minima separated by a potential barrier in the middle here. So even though these two minima are energetically equivalent, they are topologically distinguishable by virtue of the fact that the sign of the scalar field is different at these two minima here. So the, the vacuum state is not unique in this case, and therefore this type of potential supports non-trivial topology. On the other hand, if we have the simple harmonic potential, then in this case, there is only a single minimum here, which means that it's a unique minimum, uh, which only corresponds to a trivial topology. If we have this quartic potential produced at some point in the early universe, uh, and if the scalar field starts off near the top of this barrier here, there will be a, rough, a roughly 50-50 probability for the scalar field to end up in the left-handed minimum or the right-handed minimum. So in one part of the universe, the scalar field may happen to settle in the left-handed minimum. And in a very distantly located region of the universe, the scalar field may happen to settle in the other minimum, that is the right-handed minimum. Now the scalar field has to be a continuous function of the spatial coordinates. And therefore we have to cross over smoothly from one of the minima into the other uh, in this particular fashion. And this solution or the joining of these two minimum states uh, goes by a variety of different names, including the pink solution or a domain wall. Essentially, this is the boundary between the two different domain, uh, two different domains or two different uh, vacuum states. And here we're using the terminology uh, from uh, the field of condensed matter physics, where there are, of course, uh, ferromagnetic domains in these solid state systems. Um, and I should also mention that these domain walls are physical objects in the sense that there is a non-zero energy density uh, associated with the wall. And the energy density inside the wall, as well as the thickness of the wall, are both controlled by the two parameters which appear uh, in the quartic potential which produces the domain wall. If these domain walls have certain non-gravitational interactions with ordinary matter, then they may give rise to a number of interesting and potentially observable signatures. So the types of interactions which have been most commonly considered in the literature are the scalar type quadratic and phi interactions, uh, which can couple, for example, to the standard model fermions. In this case, if we compare the form of this interaction to that of the corresponding term in the standard model Lagrangian, which describes the uh, basically ordinary masses of the fermions, we see that in this case, the apparent values of the fermion masses uh, would be functions of the local value of the scalar field squared in this case. Likewise, we can also consider the phi squared interaction with the electromagnetic field tensor from the standard model. And in this case, we would expect it to be a similar apparent, uh, apparent uh, a similar apparent dependence of the electromagnetic fine structure constant alpha uh, on the local value of phi squared. Uh, now, the size of this effect is controlled not only by the amplitude of the scalar field phi, but also by the size of this parameter in the denominator here, the lambda parameters. So the parameters are generally speaking different for the different types of interactions. And these parameters have the dimensions of energy. 
So for a larger energy scale, the size of the effects uh, diminishes. But if one of these domain walls was to pass through a certain region in space, then we would expect it to produce apparent transient changes in the physical constant as a result of a temporary change in pi squared. So if our domain wall, which is this uh, hyperbolic tangent function, travels to the left, uh, then in this case, we would expect there to be a temporary change, for example, in the, in, the, uh, in the value of alpha. So if our observer is the telescope here, uh, we first start off by seeing one particular value of alpha, and then as the wall passes through us, we see a slightly different value of alpha. And finally, as the wall recedes away from us, we see the same value of alpha as what we saw initially. And we see the same value before and after the passage uh, because the effect depends on an even power of the scalar field phi rather than an odd power. So it's been proposed that we can look for these transient variations of the physical constants by using a variety of networks of detectors. Some of the possibilities which have been proposed include the use of atomic clocks. In an astrophysical context, we can also use pulsars, which are basically astrophysical clocks. So these are rapidly rotating neutron stars. And they have a reasonably stable period of rotation on a long time scale. And then in the laboratory, we can also use cavities to supplement atomic clocks. And there's also the uh, complementary technique of optical interferometry. Uh, so based on these proposals, a number of clock and cavity-based searches have actually been performed in recent years. And these have been described in a number of publications uh, and reported. And at the previous Marcel Grossman meeting in Rome, uh, we had several talks outlining the majority of these results uh, in some detail. However, it turns out that uh, there is in fact significantly more to this story than what was first assumed. In particular, in these earlier papers, uh, a number of very important effects were overlooked. Uh, and these effects concern these uh, so-called back action effects of the ambient matter field on the actual domain wall scalar field when we deal with these fine squid interactions. So if we have a non-gravitational interaction between a scalar field and an ambient matter field, then by definition, any non-gravitational interaction is bidirectional in nature. Normally what we're interested in is the so-called forwards effect of the scalar field onto the ambient matter field. This is because the ambient matter field is what typically makes, the, makes up the detector in our experiment. However, since the interaction is bidirectional, there is in principle always this backwards or back action effect of the ambient matter onto the scalar field. And it turns out that in these domain wall models where the scalar fields have phi squared interactions, these back action effects are very important. And one of the reasons why this is the case is that the uh, scalar fields in this case are assumed or believed to have a very small energy density compared with the antimatter uh, density in this case. So the energy density inside Earth or inside the shielding for an apparatus is about 30 orders of magnitude bigger than the dark energy density scale uh, with the latter scale uh, essentially associated with these uh, scalar fields uh, as a first starting point. Even if the strength of the interaction is extremely small, we cannot necessarily neglect the back action effect and we have to consider the two effects simultaneously in a self-consistent manner. Uh, when we do take this into account, we find that the back action effects would lead to quasi non-transient variations of the physical constant. So if we take a look at our five squared interactions that we wrote down a couple of slides ago, we see that if our system uh, where we have the ambient matter is non-relativistic, then we can replace these combinations of standard model field in the terms of red, uh, essentially by the corresponding mass energy components or contributions here. So if we consider the electromagnetic coupling, in this case, uh, we receive a contribution from the Coulomb binding energies of the atoms and the nuclei. And if we consider the fermion couplings, uh, then we get contributions from the electron and nuclear mass energy, uh, mass energies inside the atom in this case. Uh, so basically, what this means is that the effective potential seen by the scalar field phi is no longer simply going to be the bare potential term, which is this uh, quartic term on the left, but also we will have this extra contribution from the terms in red, which are the ambient matter induced contribution. So these go proportionally to the ambient matter density terms. Uh, and they also have a dependence which goes like phi squared instead of phi to the four. So let's look at this in some pictures. If we have a situation where, it, where we're in a low density environment 
all have a sufficiently stable interaction, then the dominant term in the effective potential is just the bare potential or quartic term here. We have a situation where we have two topologically distinct vacua, and therefore there is a non-trivial topology in this case, uh, which would allow us to support the production of the main walls and the subsequent propagation. On the other hand, if we go to a high density environment or have sufficiently strong interactions, then in this case, it's the matter induced term in red, which dominates. And this gives rise to this uh, very differently shaped potential, which has only a single unique minimum. So this only supports a trivial topology, and this will tend to destabilize domain walls or even destroy the domain walls altogether. So if we start off in a low density environment where the scale field prefers to live at one of these two minimum states, when we go over into a high density environment, we find that the scale field phi would tend to be pushed in toward the smaller value here. In other words, the scale field phi would be screened when we go to a dense environment. And so what we understand in this case is that the apparent values of the physical constants would be functions of the local value of the scalar field phi squared. And the value of the scalar field phi is in turn a function of the local antimatter density. So the apparent values of the physical constants will depend on the local matter density. So what we expect to see then is an environmental dependence of the physical constants in this case. Now this environmental dependence of physical constants can already have very important implications in the context of uh, purely terrestrial experiments. So if we have a situation where we look at Earth, we know that inside Earth, there is a comparatively large energy density, whereas outside the Earth, there is a comparatively small density. We can have a situation where the value of the scale of field phi here is strongly screened inside Earth and close to Earth's surface. But as we go outside of Earth's surface, uh, beyond the atmosphere and very far away from Earth, the scale of field value would tend towards its preferred value at phi naught, which is the minimum, uh, which is the minimum of the bare quartic potential here. So what we basically have here is a spherical bubble-like defect which surrounds Earth. And this is a very interesting object because it's essentially expected to be fixed to Earth as a quasi-permanent uh, fixture. Uh, by comparison, if we have a freely propagating domain wall of cosmological origin, then this type of wall, which is cosmologically produced, would have a planar geometry rather than a spherical geometry. Nevertheless, if the thickness of this planar domain wall is say by the parameter G, then the thickness of the spherical bubble-like defect on the left is going to be set by the minimum of the thickness parameter D or by the size of Earth in this case. In other words, regardless of the value of the parameter D, the thickness of this bubble uh, can never significantly exceed the size of Earth. And this comes from the consideration of minimizing the energy which is stored in this bubble. So what these spherical bubble-like defects allow us to do is actually look for a number of very generic signatures which could be present even if the universe had only a single domain or vacuum state. In other words, we can look for these generic signatures even in the case when the universe produced no cosmological domain walls. Uh, this is obviously very exciting from an experimental point of view because it means that we don't necessarily have to wait for a possibly single or non-existent domain wall of a cosmological origin to pass by the Earth. So if we have these circle bubble like defects around uh, the Earth, we would expect there to be spatial variations and spatial gradients in the fundamental constants around the Earth, for example, in the value of alpha. So inside Earth and close to Earth's surface, we expect to see one particular value of alpha in this case. And as we move away from that surface, we would expect to tend towards a different value of the fine structure constant in this case. Now we can look for these spatial gradients in a variety of different ways. Uh, here I'll use the example of the uh, alpha gradient in this case. And the first such possibility that we can use involves accelerometry style measurements. Uh, so the basic observation here is that in the presence of this uh, gradient in alpha, we expect there to be additional anomalous accelerations exerted on test bodies. And these accelerations will arise because the overall uh, masses of a test body, uh, masses of test bodies would depend on the value of alpha because the overall mass of an atom uh, receives a contribution from the Coulomb binding energy of the atom and the nucleus. So if we have materials, uh, we, if, we have if we have two different materials making up our two test bodies in this case, 
then the two test masses will have slightly different relative contributions from the coolant binding energy. So they respond slightly differently to this gradient alpha, and we would expect these two test bodies to fall at slightly different rates uh, toward the center of Earth in this case. So because the acceleration is not the same in this case, these forces would therefore violate the equivalent principle. Another idea to look for these uh, spatial variations in alpha is to compare clocks at different heights. And in this case, we want to look for atomic clock frequency shifts, which are correlated with these uh, changes in the uh, fine structure constant alpha. Uh, and these clock frequency shifts would be distinct from the usual gravitational redshift effect, which is uh, another effect which is present when we vary the clock height. The ideal experiment to do in this case would be to compare a clock located close to that surface with another clock which is located uh, at least 10,000 kilometers away from Earth's surface, for example, on board a satellite or a spaceship in this case. Uh, the reason why we only need about 10,000 kilometers of separation is because the thickness of the spherical bubble-like defects can never be significantly larger uh, than the size of Earth in this case. So we get no further advantage in increasing this height separation in the case here. Uh, of course, clock-based measurements uh, in space would be ideal, but uh, space-based measurements are notoriously expensive and difficult to conduct. So instead, what we can also do is also use the state-of-the-art optical clocks in a ground-based setting where we can take advantage of the height separations in very large structures, for example, man-made structures. Uh, in this regard, there is already uh, a very good experiment which was recently conducted by Professor Kateri's group uh, in Tokyo. Uh, and basically in that experiment, there was a pair of strontium optical clocks separated by a high difference of about half a kilometer in Tokyo Skytree. And on Tuesday, we had a talk by Mikhail Kukumoto, uh, who gave a very nice overview of how this experiment was used to test the uh, gravitational redshift between these two clocks. Another idea is actually to compare atomic and molecular uh, transition frequencies in the laboratory with their uh, analogous counterparts in distantly separated gas clouds. Now these gas clouds are very interesting because not only do they have a very small density compared with even some of the best vacuum systems that we can produce in the laboratory, uh, but also these gas clouds are expected to be uh, very large, in fact, of astronomical size. And this combination of low density and large size turns out to be very useful for probing certain regions of parameter space, which are practically inaccessible to, uh, practically inaccessible to purely uh, laboratory measurements because of the screening of the scalar field in these dense environments. What is very interesting is that in this model of uh, scalar field domain walls with the quartic potential and the phi squared interaction, there is a very natural mechanism for cosmologically producing such domain walls as well. So first of all, if we start in the early universe where we have uh, a very sizable energy density of ambient matter, for example, uh, then in this case, we would expect the form, the form of the effect potential to be dominated by the matter induced term. And in this case, there'd only be a single minimum uh, over here. So there's a trivial topology in this case, which does not allow for the formation of the main wall to begin with. However, over time, as the universe expands, the energy density of ambient matter tends to dilute. And at a certain point in time, they can, uh, they can arise a critical moment where we have a phase transition and the form of the effective potential would now change its shape uh, to more closely resemble the uh, bare potential or quartic term in red over here. Now, because we have the two topologically distinct minimum states in this case, in this case, we can in fact produce cosmological domain walls. And the general argument in this case is that distantly separated regions tend to settle in different uh, vacua or minimum states. And we expect of the order of about one domain wall to survive for the present day. So this is the wall of cosmological origin. We only expect about one because unless these walls um, unless these walls happen to be nearly parallel aligned, we have to keep in mind that the walls have a basically infinite extent into spatial dimensions. So unless the walls are stacked in a pancake formation, uh, two walls will tend to uh, touch. Uh, and also we expect them to then reconnect and annihilate very efficiently if that happens in order to minimize the energy in this domain wall network. Nevertheless, even if there was only a single such wall surviving to the present day, and stretching across the observable size of the universe, we expect its gravitational effects to be very profound. In particular measurements uh, pertaining to the cosmic microwave background radiation, constrain the total energy in such a wall uh, at one part per 100,000, 
of the total energy budget of the universe. So these are the limits uh, on the scalar field the main world model where we have these phi squared interactions with the, with the electromagnetic field. And this is for the case where we assume uh, the minimal cosmology, that is minimal assumptions about the cosmology, and this produces a single domain wall. And we further assume that the energy in this wall is going to saturate the maximal allowable energy density consistent with the CMB observations. So when we make these assumptions, we find that the limits from the accelerometers give the bounds in green and blue. Uh, so the green one is a space-based experiment, it's a microscope mission, and the blue one is a ground-based Utwash experiment. Uh, then there are also clock comparison measurements at different heights in red and yellow. So the red one is recent ground-based Tokyo Skytree experiment, and the yellow measurements here are hydrogen meter comparisons uh, from the space to the ground in this case. So what we basically see in this case is that the colored regions here give up to a 15 orders of magnitude improvement uh, over the previous uh, and different types of non-transient signatures in the dark gray region here. And also we see these interesting colored lines in purple and brown here, uh, which are the regions of parameters which could allow these domain walls to be cosmologically produced, uh, for example, shortly after the BBN epoch or shortly after the CMB epoch. We can, of course, repeat this for various other times in the universe. But the main conclusion is that knowing how the new limits scale with the overall energy density in this wall, we can actually constrain the energy density, uh, the maximal energy density in the wall at a level of one part in 10 billion of the total energy density uh, of the universe. So this is at least five orders of magnitude more stringent uh, than the uh, generic CMB bound above here. And also what is crucial in this regard are these uh, limits in light gray, which I've derived here. So these come from the comparisons of atomic and molecular transition lines in laboratory, in laboratory with low density astrophysical gas clouds here. And these actually allow us to rule out a region of space, which is otherwise not accessible with purely terrestrial experiments of the type which I considered. And we'll see this on the next slide. Okay, so we can also contemplate the possibility that these uh, five squared interactions may also arise for scalar field domain walls, where the energy densities inside the walls uh, could be amplified inside the galaxy to be comparable to the local dark matter density. Uh, and furthermore, we can also assume uh, an average time of passage, which is quite regular, for example, of the order of a day, like we do here, uh, but still assuming that these uh, passages of the walls are well separated relative to the width of the wall. So these are just the assumptions which have been made in the previous literature to derive the uh, limits which are shown by the purple lines and brown lines here. So these are the searches for the transient signatures of these pass into main walls through Earth using, uh, using atomic clocks. And basically what we find is that by making these same assumptions as in the earlier searches, we derive the limits shown in the colored regions here, which are given in green and blue, for the accelerometers. And then we have the limits in red and yellow for the clock comparison measurements at different heights. Essentially, we see that there's a sizable improvement of the previous searches from the transient signatures. And also there's a very big uh, advantage over the previous and different types of non-transient signatures in the region uh, in the region in dark gray over here. In fact, in that case, uh, the improvement is actually by up to 10 orders of magnitude. Uh, and this was actually the previous benchmark with, which was used in these uh, to compare with for the transient searches. Uh, another point which I'd like to draw your attention to is that if we uh, take these previous uh, clock-based limits, searching for these transient signatures at phase value, then they happen to lie in regions of parameter space where the scalar field would either be strongly screened inside the Earth or also screened by the atmosphere or even screened by the apparatus itself. And so if we take into consideration there's going to be a strongly repulsive potential generated by the Earth or by the atmosphere or the apparatus, then it may in principle prevent the unperturbed passage of the domain wall through the earth uh, or the apparatus. Uh, and this is actually contrary to the early assumptions, uh, which just assumed a simple unperturbed passage of the domain wall through earth. And so potentially it may be necessary to revisit these previous analyses uh, and reanalyze the data to look for qualitatively different signatures. Uh, in particular, one thing which could happen is that uh, if this wall approaches earth, instead of simply passing through the earth, uh, part of the wall which is uh, in closest contact with the Earth could start to wrap around the Earth and then pinch off. So the rest of the wall could pass through the Earth, uh, sorry, could pass through around the Earth, whereas we would be left with this film or bubble surrounding the Earth. Uh, 
uh, this bubble could in principle be either stable or metastable, depending on the parameters uh, involved in the problem. If it's metastable, then this bubble will be expected to oscillate a number of times before collapsing to the center of Earth and then radiating the energy away in the form of relativistic scalar particles. Uh, so the main take-home message here is that the transient signatures which were sought previously may in fact be qualitatively different. And this is a question of ongoing uh, numerical work which requires detailed simulations to answer uh, in detail. And finally, to come around full circle, I'd just like to end the discussion by uh, relating these back action effects and screening phenomena in the case of domain walls to what has actually been previously studied in the case of oscillating dark matter fields. Uh, so we know that it's possible to have an oscillating scalar dark matter field phi, uh, where the angular frequency of oscillation is set by the mass of the dark matter particle, and the amplitude of the oscillation is set by the parameter phi naught. Uh, so the amplitude of the oscillation phi naught is fixed by the local energy density and by the mass of the dark matter particle. Basically, the scalar field amplitude here grows with the Compton wavelength associated with the dark matter field. On the other hand, uh, the uh, scalar field amplitude for a domain wall tends to grow with the separation or the average separation between adjacent domain walls of a cosmological origin. And if we do the calculation microly, it actually, it actually grows somewhat uh, slower than the average separation. We find that if we have comparable time scales for the period of oscillation with the dark matter field, uh, as compared with the average time of separation between the adjacent domain walls, uh, that in this case, the amplitude, uh, the scalar field amplitude would always be much smaller for uh, a domain wall than it is for an oscillating dark matter field. Having this larger scalar field amplitude for an oscillating scalar dark matter field turns out to be advantageous when we're looking for these sparse grid interactions. Now we see that the oscillating, uh, that searches for the oscillating effects of the dark matter field with atomic clocks, like with the rubidium cesium comparison, gives the limits shown in red, which is far away from the strong screening region where the scalar field will be strongly screened inside the Earth. And this is associated with this much larger scalar field amplitude in this case. And why this is interesting is that the analogous bounds from the uh, essentially non-oscillating signatures of the accelerometers, which are the analog of these quasi non transient signatures for domain walls, are shown in blue here. But with clock-based searches for oscillating signatures, we can improve by up to a factor of 100 in this case. And this improvement is associated with the oscillating signatures only scaling to the second power of the interaction parameter, whereas the non-oscillating signature scales to the fourth power here. So the basic, basic take-home message is that if we want to look for this five squared interaction with atomic clocks, it is much easier to look for the oscillating signatures of an oscillating scalar dark matter field than it is to look for the transient signatures uh, of a part in the main wall. Okay, so to summarize, I pointed out that the back action effects of ambient matter onto the scalar field in models of topological defects with five squared interactions give rise to quasi and transient variations of the physical constant. And by looking for these signatures using a number of data sets from accelerometers and clock comparison measurements, I was able to place more stringent bounds uh, than the previous limits from complementary types of transient and non-transient signatures. Uh, and the improvement in some cases is very significant anywhere by up to 15 orders of magnitude. And finally, uh, we should also note that uh, the previous clock-based searches for the transient signatures of passing domain walls uh, may have assumed qualitatively incorrect signatures in the analyses because of the fact that they neglected uh, back action effects. And so it may be necessary to revisit and reanalyze these data sets uh, in the future. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Oh, Eka, yes, please. Thank you. Yeah, maybe I maybe I missed. Um, can you? Yeah, um, I understand the um, the thickness of the the width of the domain wall um, is essentially a free parameter in this uh, in this analysis. Is this is this correct, or can you say is there are there any principles or so uh, to make? Uh, predictions on a somewhat expected uh, parameter range or reasonable parameter range where, uh, yeah, that would be physically maybe more motivated than other ranges. Um, I think it's quite difficult. It is basically a free parameter. Um, 
if we're talking about a simple cosmological domain wall, then uh, it can be the thickness can be anywhere up to almost the current size or horizon size of the universe. Uh, and it can go all the way down to the reciprocal of a very large energy density scale. So it can be almost subatomic in size. There's a very, very wide range of freedom in this in this problem, unfortunately, and it's difficult to pin down uh, which regions would be, say, better motivated. Um, but certainly no, no, no obvious sizes are ruled out except for the very simple requirements that it's probably, um, the size has to be at least as big as the Planck scale, but no bigger than the observed size of the universe. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's similar to the problem with dark matter. There's 60 orders of magnitude of possible particle masses, uh, which are consistent with the observations. And this is one of the reasons why it's very difficult uh, to pin down uh, where exactly we should be looking. Okay, should consider to look everywhere. Thank you. Best to look everywhere, exactly, yes. Uh, any other questions? Okay, if not, uh, let's move on to the next talk. Uh, next speaker is uh, Mariana Safronova. Uh, if you'd like to share your slides, please. Okay, just a moment. Share. <clears throat> can you see my slides? Uh, perfect, yes, I can see your slides and uh, excellent. Uh, whenever you're ready, please. Thank you so much. So uh, thank you so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to speak again at the Marcel Grossman meeting. I will talk about uh, dark matter searches with atomic and nuclear clocks. So first, uh, many fundamental physics problems already have been raised during this um, meeting. So I would like just to summarize some of the really major things. First, of course, we have this missing matter and we have plentiful observation and that's, you know, we, we do believe the dark matter is a solution here. However, we have no idea what that is. Then we have observations that indicate that the universe is expanding at acceleration rate. Again, we don't know what dark energy is. It's just our label for this effect. Uh, presumably, if there is also missing matter, missing energies, very likely we have more fundamental interactions beyond the standard model. Then we, of course, don't know yet what the source of matter antimatter asymmetry is. And then we have this bizarre hierarchy problem that the mass, I mean, it can be phrased in a different way. One way is that like why the Higgs field is barely turned on. And this is actually a very natural universe, the one they lived in. Or why is the masses of known particles so much lighter than fundamental energy scales or the unification of fundamental forces. And uh, the reason why I showed, wanted to show this um, kind of a longer list uh, when talking about dark matter is that our best dark matter scenarios are those which solve more than one problem that, uh, for example, WIMPs could solve a uh, uh, dark matter in a hierarchy problem. And uh, it's an interesting feature whether you can actually have a light dark matter, which light dark matter, which does the same thing. So, uh, and that's what I'll show today as well. Atomic clocks can measure and compare frequencies to exceptional precision. And uh, Vladimir Duba has this very nice talk about <clears throat> uh, different sensitivities for different clock and Victor Flambaum and Evgeny Stadi here talked about using clocks and we'll hear more from accurate type. But the basic idea of why the clocks are so good, it's because when you can measure frequencies to any significant figures, it also means that you understand systematics to any significant figures. And in this case, if you have some sort of new physics uh, shifts your frequency, that atomic clock may be able to detect this. And uh, in this case, a beautiful feature that essentially your new physics can show up as a systematics in your clock. On the other hand, of course, it's best to build dedicated clocks, which are the most sensitive to those effects. And uh, then uh, you will have the largest chance to find uh, some new physics. Is uh, it been mentioned that atomic clocks can be used to test whether fundamental constants are constant. There are re related searches of test of equivalent principle because Earth's orbit is slightly eccentric. So you can actually see if there's any difference between uh, January and June, for example. And uh, this has been shown a few years back to be related to dark matter searches. You can search for violation of Lorentz invariance and uh, the best limits on uh, Lorentz invariance with clocks uh, 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 actually 
provide the best limit for the violation of Lorentz invariance in the electron sector, which I could quite, uh, uh, I will probably mention. And then there have been interesting proposals on gravitational wave detection with flux. And uh, the actually the scope of those proposals is always expanding. So the question is what dark matter can affect atomic energy levels because not all dark matter would. For example, <clears throat> in, the, in this case, uh, very heavy dark matter, it will not actually affect atomic energy levels, even though you can actually see uh, interesting effects of um, uh, dark matter scattering of electrons, but that's not what we're talking here. To actually direct atom uh, affect atomic energy levels, you, for example, need to change a fine structure constant because all of the energy levels would depend on a fine structure constant. And then if different clocks would uh, be affected differently, then you can actually look for it. So the question here is what new particles can you detect if you can measure changes to atomic nuclear frequencies to, you know, okay, depending on your optimism, 19, 20 or more significant figures. And the good feature is can our new particle also be answered to another fundamental question? And the uh, atomic clocks are sensitive to very light dark matter. <clears throat> it's possible to actually go to somewhat high, uh, higher uh, masses with spectroscopy measurements, such as Russell experiment. Uh, but uh, if you talk about atomic clocks, the question is what is the fundamental scale of atomic clock probes? And this is about one second or a few seconds or somewhat less than that, and that places you within those bounds. Of course, uh, if, uh, dark, if your particle is not 100% dark matter, you can actually go beyond 10 to the minus 22. And essentially, the lighter is your particle, the better atomic clocks are technically detecting it. And the basic idea here is that within those masses, we are talking about a very large uh, number of particles per your de Broglie volume. And therefore, we're not talking about detection of those particle by particle. We're really talking about uh, the dark matter which exhibits coherence and behaves like a wave. And the main idea here, which was an initial paper of Minori Niwataki and co is that if you have the dark matter field which couples to electromagnetic interaction normal matter, what will it do? Well, let's say you either couple linearly or quadratically uh, to your Lagrangian from, uh, you heard a uh, <coughs> wonderful talk by Evgeny uh, about the quadratic couplings and uh, also the topological dark matter. But let's say if you have a linear coupling, for example, then you just directly multiply your Lagrangian by your um, <clears throat> then uh, field. And if you quadratic coupling, well, you multiply by square field. And uh, of course, uh, this will provide uh, an additional small constant. But that's what we'll do. It will make fundamental coupling constants and the mass ratio oscillate. And if that happens, then atomic or nuclear energy level will oscillate. So clock frequency will oscillate. So if you actually measure the ratios of the clock frequencies or clock to cavity, that can be detected. And this is a present bounds. And uh, the green bound here, it's a projected uh, strontium to silicon cavity limit. So the question is how we can do much, much better. So how we can actually do by many more orders of magnitude. And uh, in addition, uh, can any of this scalar particles actually answer another fundamental questions? And the answer is here, yes. So returning a little bit back to the hierarchy problem, the reason that we actually it's a big problem is that this makes our universe very unnatural. So if you put some initial conditions and then see what universes you will end up with, that you will have Higgs field which is fully on and then all particles at Planck scale masses, essentially your universe just full of little black holes. Or you have no masses and uh, clearly ours is not uh, <clears throat> really this universe. Uh, mathematically, you actually see a uh, very, obvious problem that if you have a Higgs a scalar particle, then uh, even most obvious standard model corrections will produce quadratic divergences, putting this mass scale back to Planck scale. And of course, then you have uh, many, many of those diagrams contributing. And to have all of them cancel essentially nearly exactly uh, at all energy scales, that seems like really impossible. So there has to be some sort of interesting symmetry, uh, perhaps at work and uh, it will generate, will generate some more particles. So supersymmetry is one of the solutions and uh, WIMPs uh, could be supersymmetric particles. The problem is neither ILHC or um, any of the WIMP searches has found any so far. And one of the other possibilities suggested recently is a dynamical explanation uh, relaxation, 
which has a relaxed tone. There is a, uh, some long history on now those proposals. So I just show um, the one where relaxion have um, actually natural relaxed uh, region. And in this case, with this parameter space, it can actually be reached by a nuclear clock. And the reason why a nuclear clock and not specific any of the atomic clocks, not only nuclear clock is more sensitive, for the relaxion, the coupling to gluons is actually more significant than to electromagnetic tensor, and nuclear clocks would have uh, uniquely large couplings to the nuclear sector here. And the basic idea here is that you actually have the relaxion, it's a light spin zero field, which would dynamically relax as a Higgs mass with respect to its natural value. And of course, uh, the more dark matter you have, the easiest to find it. And uh, uh, this work has been uh, done uh, by Gilad Perez's group. And uh, they also consider the case when you have a large halo of dark matter around either Earth or, uh, or the sun, and there are experimental limits of how much dark matter you can tolerate within the solar uh, system, but nevertheless, uh, within those limits, it will show that in this case, the nuclear clocks actually probes would probe well within the uh, region of the uh, relaxing parameter space. And essentially, no other experiment would uh, at those particular masses. So the next question is, how do we significantly improve those new physics tests? And the first idea, of course, here is to improve clocks. And uh, surely this is going to be done. And uh, I have all faith that the clocks will improve by orders of magnitude. But then the question is, let's see if you can actually build also very, very accurate clocks. But those who will have more sensitivity to all of those interesting effects. And uh, just to show, and you already have seen uh, from Vladimir Zuba, you actually have uh, seen some of those uh, numbers that most current clocks, with exception of a terbium uh, uh, three plus, actually have very small sensitivities. And the reason why this terbium plus E3 is so special is because you have a whole F electron, which actually places F uh, orbital very close to the nuclei. Is there an enhancement of relativistic effects? And there is enhancement sensitivity to alpha of minus six. So what we want, we want as large difference in those key factors as possible. And uh, this just does not exist for uh, neutrals or current singly charged sign clock. We also recently had proposal uh, that uh, you can actually have uh, sensitivity of 15 and uh, Vladimir also showed their proposal uh, in Uterbium with a different type of uh, clock in the turbium, so there are actually two clock transitions in the turbium, and they actually started a new project to uh, compute magic wavelengths and more properties, so, so these transitions can be experimentally developed. But of course, uh, another very large sensitivities could be provided with either nuclear clock or clocks with ultra-cold highly charged ions. And I have to say that I do think that progress with experimental ultra-cold highly charged ion has actually been extremely fast. And uh, in this case, the reason why highly charged tines were not used for clocks initially is because there was no way of pull and trap them. And the whole arena of highly charged tines was completely separate from the clock community. And the advantage of the highly charged tines is that not only you actually have such large enhancement factors, that you also have very rich structure of uh, uh, your electronic energy levels, and you have, uh, for example, possibility of extremely long quantum memories as well. And you do, in fact, have optical transitions. And this argon 13 plus transition had been used actually for the few first experimental tests with uh, ultra cold, highly charged ions. And the first experiment was done by <clears throat> uh, Jose Crespo's group at PTB. And they demonstrated the first sympathetic cooling of highly charged ions when they actually took a, a beryllium plus coulomb crystals, and you can see those individual beryllium plus ions, and they injected the highly charged ions in here. And you can see those large blobs are actually argon 13 plus. And uh, in the next uh, experiment, only just nearly five years ago at PTB, in collaboration with MPIK, they actually demonstrate a coherent laser spectroscopy with uh, argon 13 plus. And in this case, this is exactly the same scheme aluminum plus is, uh, clock is using when you actually have one ion, <clears throat> which is your clock ion, and another ion is, is an ion which does uh, all the cooling, all the probing. And in a remarkable feat, the precision improved by seven orders of magnitude in this one single experiment. So with a uh, hot ions, the best which was done was actually the penny trap measurement at the 10 to the minus eight level. And in this case, this is actually 10 to the minus 15, which is remarkable. Uh, 
So the progress here is expected very fast, and hopefully next five years, uh, we will see 10 to the minus 18 highly charged ions, and maybe in 10 years, hopefully, the 10 to the minus 18 ions with actually very high sensitivities. And uh, <clears throat> the, uh, one of the issues with proposals of highly charged ions is lack of data and a special lack of data for uh, ions with high sensitivities. So we picked actually two of the suggested candidates, which were uh, 17 plus and 15 plus, and done a very detailed studies in collaboration with Pete Schmidt, who have uh, done analysis of the possible systematic effects. And this is probably the most uh, accurate calculations <clears throat> Key which was done. This is a CI plus a uh, couple cluster method for both of those ions. In fact, Californium 17 plus is actually considered a three electron system uh, rather than one electron system, and that actually changes the level significantly. And uh, we had predictions of systematic effects of the lifetimes, of the polarizabilities, or the wavelengths. And uh, <clears throat> uh, we found that actually this proposal had been funded, and in the UK, Following the zero prediction, and hopefully we'll actually have experimental data on those ions. It'll be very, very interesting to actually compare it because computations of actinides actually is a very, very complicated issue. And uh, if you did get this right, therefore some of the computations of the other more complicated actinides for uh, neutrals and singly charged ions, uh, also which, which much need to nuclear physics, could actually be verified as well because there are essentially very, very few tests on anything which has a 5-5 electron. And uh, this would provide actually benchmarks test of theory. If you compare it to those ions, then the sensitivity to variation of fundamental constants is about 100. And Californium actually has a long-lived isotope. So this one about 1,000 years. Uh, there is spin zero isotope is about 13 years. So this is actually quite reasonable. Uh, well, after all, you only need one or a few ions. Of course, uh, the question is just how many ions do you actually need to start with to put one in a trap? Because the efficiency of the current traps is actually not large, but that have not been an issue with this organ and uh, new injection systems uh, would be built to actually inject the um, ions in small quantities. So you already heard the story of the thorium nuclear clock. And uh, this is one unusual nuclei which has transition at about 150 nanometers. This is really the only known exception within the laser accessible frequencies. There is also a recent review uh, on the progress and the proposal uh, of the ERC collaboration synergy team. Um, so the hope here is that you actually have enhancement of 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, and there's been recent progress in actually taking the experimental measurements and uh, trying to extract the Coulomb energy. So it's very interesting to see what's actually going to happen here. Uh, I would like to point out that exact uh, sensitivity is actually not important here. What's important is that the larger it is, the most chance actually nuclear clock has uh, to detect new physics. And the interesting question, since it all relies on uh, different magnetic, uh, different nuclear moments, is what are actually the nuclear moments and how well do we know the magnetic dipole and electric quadruple moment of the thorium 2.9 nuclear, especially since this did not agree with either nuclear physics prediction, which is not particularly surprising, nor with actually the previous measured value. So we decided to actually uh, do this calculation again, because in our previous calculations of the hyperfine constants, we did use linearized couple cluster methods with some only some partial triple excitations, and we also did use some empirical fits. So the question is, can you actually do better work, which is a completely ab initio, and new code, uh, full couple cluster, single double, full triple, including core and valence triple, have been developed by Sergey Porsev. And uh, we find that in the level of inclusion of uh, all nonlinear terms, nonlinear terms were included as, as the level. Then the valence triples and then core triples and the core triples have been included to the best of our knowledge to absolutely the first time in, this, in such method you actually have better and better and better agreement with experiment. And in this case, the removal energies agreed to better than 0.3%, and actually the uh, actual energy agreed to uh, 0 0.1 to 0.3% in this case. And this is actually uh, uh, extraordinary good agreement for such a complicated heavy ion. So the next question is how well do we know the hyperfines? And in this case, uh, the precision which we estimate to be on actual hyperfine constants is actually below 1% for certain cases. But the question is that there is a bohr weiss effect. So the question is the real nuclear magnetization can actually differ from the uniform magnetization. And initially we thought, well, but those are F and D states. They don't overlap with the nuclear. There shouldn't be any effect. 
but we already actually seen it on the QED effects and ISDOP shifts that uh, any effects of the nuclei can actually affect the self-consistent potential via the S states. And in this case, this can actually affect the other states as well. And the effect can be very, very strong. In fact, in California, when you have F states, there is actually is significant QD correction, even though you normally do not expect it in F level. And this is all back action of the core electrons uh, on the your F and D electrons. So uh, lacking completely any realistic magnetization potential, and we do talk with nuclear physics colleagues to see if they can actually provide one, but uh, lacking any data on actual nuclear magnetization. So here is what uh, actually we decided to do, and this work was done by Michael Kozlov and uh, Sergey Korsev in actually following the Yuri Demidis paper in 2021. And the idea here is as following. Let's say now, <clears throat> then we can calculate the theoretical value with a point-like magnetization of the nuclei. And then we can also calculate the uh, different calculate the one with uh, monetization as a uniform uh, distribution, which is exactly the same as the charge distribution. So you could, in this case, then compute those y coefficients because this is all theory contribution. So then you end up with actually a creation which has two unknowns. <clears throat> you don't know what the g factor, and you don't know what the denuke is. And denuke is the <clears throat> And then the nuclear part of the structure, which is not described as uniform monetization. So at point, uh, point monetization is zero, and for uniform monetization is one. And uh, what we did, we actually substituted, <coughs> excuse me, and we substituted the experimental numbers here. An experiment is um, from Alex Kuzmich group. You see it's a slightly uh, below 1% accuracy. And uh, taking the five, half, uh, five halves and 63 halves, which have the most precise experiment in theory, we actually come up with restriction on the nuke that, well, it could be zero, it could be one, but it could also be four. And in this case, it places about two, actually 2% 2 uncertainty <coughs> on magnetic moment. And this very largely comes from actually uncertainty and Borovice coefficient here. So what we do need, we actually need better measurements of the hyperfine constants. We also need measurements for different states. <coughs> Alternatively, we also have about 10 minutes to go. To 10 okay. minutes. Yeah, uh, we also actually need a realistic monetization distribution, and then we can actually insert it in the codes and see if that actually matches what we get from this idea of experimental data. But definitely more precise experimental data, and perhaps actually data for the S state in uh, thorium, uh, which would uh, thorium 3 plus, which would actually have very different dependence on nuclear monetization because this dependence is all uh, looks small. Uh, would actually be beneficial to sorting out what Bohr's Weiss coeffect is. And understanding how to compute Bohr's Weiss coeffect actually would have significance to extraction nuclear moments of, of the actinides with uh, a new Michigan free facility. For the quadruple moment situation is much better that here the, uh, our new precision is actually better than uh, 1%. And, uh, and last, I would like to show this uh, new calculation of thorium 35 plus. There was this idea in the parallel paper it was from uh, Adriana Palfi uh, group and Quasars of actually uh, doing electronic bridge excitation. And the reason why it's specifically such a weird thing, thorium 35 plus, is that you actually have accidental degeneracy here, is that the electronic transition seem to be very, very close, much closer than in any of the other ions to the uh, isomeric transition <clears throat> with your uh, nuclei. So the idea here is that you take an intermediate state and you uh, shine a laser here which to make this transition. This is very nice visible uh, uh, frequency. And then this is actually very nearly the nuclear clock transition. So then you actually get pretty much all this energy to the nuclei uh, to excite the isomeric state. And with our new calculation, which has 120 million determinants, at that time, that was the largest run we have ever run with a new uh, MPI code, which was developed by Charles Chen, that we actually found that it looks like the energy is actually much closer. So it's actually uh, 8.31, and we found the results actually very, very stable. So we included up to actually 4p shell. We did, in fact, include uh, here all of those electrons in the, computa in the CI computation, and we find that at the level of 4p shells, the change is actually very small. We also done studies with a basis set, and the computation is stable to this level. Uh, of course, since there is a large uncertainty at what the nuclear transition uh, actually is, so uh, it could be 831 or it could be um, 8.1, and that affects very strongly the uh, actually electronic bridge uh, excitation 
frequency, and this paper actually had been recently published in quantum uh, um, in the quantum science and technology journal. And then uh, in the end, I would like to talk a little bit about our new project. So the idea is that when you actually do the computation of the theorist, so what you normally do, okay, well, you compute a few numbers and the few can be one or it could be like a page table and you publish them. And uh, this does not really answer the needs of the community because in many cases, <clears throat> many different data are needed. Astrophysics actually needed, uh, astrophysics needs massive amounts of data. And <clears throat> also it's good to have uh, all data in machine readable format that it's possible to put it in different codes. So the question is how to actually get all the data which could have been calculated with codes to the community. So what we did, we actually converting all our codes to software. What it means is that that essentially can be run at the push of a button. So um, anything which we think can be computed with default parameters would have default parameters set and those would be automatically uh, produced. So essentially the, anything, the only thing which user needs to input is what electrons do you want and what properties do you want. And uh, we find that anything with one, two, three, and probably four electrons in a project table could actually be computed this way. And afterwards, we are computing everything which actually can be computed with those codes, uh, putting as large numerical parameters as we have to produce as much data as possible. So for the linearized couple cluster code, this actual automation is complete. And we do now have 12 elements computed automatically. And the automation of the CI codes is a progress to make sure that input and output interface are extremely user-friendly. And in this course, I would just would like to briefly show how our portal looks like. And here is a link. So this is also already online. Oops, sorry. And... Uh, So here is our link to the portal. As you see, you have uh, 12 elements, which are now currently valuable. And uh, if you click, for example, on Strontium Plus, that you see all possible matrix elements for Strontium Plus, and those can be selected by state. So here are all the matrix elements actually from 5P3 half to up to actually 13S, up to everything to which we have buttons. You can actually go to transition rates, for example, here for cesium. And again, you can actually get the lifetime, uh, all the transition rates or you can actually get all of the transition rates and you can sort them by either the wavelengths uh, or by the transition rate. So here you can sort them by wavelengths and here uh, also you get the matrix element as well. And uh, in this case, we also have polarizabilities. So let's say polarizabilities of rubidium and uh, it will plot a graph. You can actually combine the graphs. For example, this produces a combined 5S and 5P graph. Uh, we will actually have magic wavelengths and magic zero wavelengths determined uh, in the future here. We also provide the nuclear data. Uh, all the static polarizabilities are provided as well in one large table here. And for the nuclear data, it's just convenient to uh, have those rather than uh, search through all the various data tables. So here is the nuclear data with uh, RMS radio, magnetic moment, quadrupole moment which are collected from all the different nuclear physics sources. We also do provide hyperfine constants. For now, those are published sources, but we will actually have them um, uh, recomputed for all of those elements. So this is a very, very first version of it. And uh, in this case, we actually plan a very large expanse of the site uh, mid-fall. Uh, we uh, would like to actually have a highly charged science in there. So all of the highly charged science which we have computed, we already have all tables actually from published sources, including the California ions ready to be inserted in the portal right now uh, with a new design, which allows us to include uh, different properties for different elements. So all of the alkaline earth uh, will be included uh, in mid-fall release. And we expect to have about 35 atoms and ions by the mid-fall release. So atomic and nuclear clocks uh, give great potential for discovering new physics. Many new developments come in the next 10 years. So we need new ideas how to use uh, quantum technologies for uh, new physics searches. And uh, I would like to thank all of my collaborators and the group at the University of Delaware. Thank you so much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Mariana, for the nice talk. Are there any questions?
Mm. A very clear talk there. Okay, well, if there are no questions, uh, let us thank Mariana again. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Eckhard. If you would like to uh, share your slides, please. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, I hope you can you see my slides. Uh, yes, I can see your slides and pointer. Great. Um, yeah, it's my pleasure to uh, present um, improved limits on uh, on violations of LPI and LLI. Uh, today, uh, I, I vividly remember the Marcel Grossman meeting 2018 when we met uh, in Rome and uh, where I gave a, uh, a talk maybe with a very similar title and uh, showed some of the data on related clock comparisons that were uh, somewhat preliminary at the, um, at the time. So we continued uh, to measurements to improve experiments over the years. And last year, finally, we decided um, to do a definite analysis uh, in order to be able to provide to the metrology uh, committees uh, recommended values for the atomic transition frequencies and frequency ratios. Uh, and also at the same time to uh, make a definite analysis of these partly years long uh, data set um, in terms of limits of, uh, of violations of, of LPI and NLI. And so I'm very happy today uh, to present you definite uh, data that, that have been uh, published uh, earlier this year. So um, the system we are looking at is uh, optical frequency standards uh, based on uh, Euterbium Plus. Uh, I'm starting to show the level uh, scheme here uh, of the Euterbium Plus um, ion. Uh, it has uh, a number of uh, important advantages that make it suitable as an optical uh, clock. So there's technical points like all transitions uh, for the cooling and the reference transition can be driven by diet lasers. The ion has a large uh, mass. So at a given temperature, it has relatively low uh, Doppler shift. Uh, one can obtain very long uh, storage time due to favorable chemical properties. Um, and most importantly, for what I'm going to speak about today, uh, there is two different uh, reference clock transitions. So from the ground state, uh, there is uh, an electric quadrupole transition S to D, and there is an electric octopole transition uh, S to F. And these uh, two transitions have very different properties. Um, the uh, quadrupole transition uh, having about a Hertz level line width. The octopole transition, of course, uh, is more strongly forbidden, much narrower with a lifetime in the range of several years. Um, and also the electronic structure of the two transi transitions is very different. So the quadrupole transition being the excitation of an S electron to the D orbital, whereas the octopole transition being the opening of the closed 4F shell, promoting a 4F electron to the 6S uh, shell so that the 6S shell becomes uh, closed and the hole in the 4F shell in this excited state here. So the, therefore the octopole transition is strongly um, relativistic and has a large sensitivity to the value of the fine structure constant and is very well suited for tests uh, of fundamental physics. And especially convenient, we can look at both uh, systems in the same ion. We are working with the uh, Euterbium 171 isotope, which has a nuclear spin of uh, one half, uh, which nicely couples with the electron so that we have a uh, non-degenerate ground state F equals zero and can drive these reference transitions with magnetic field independent MF zero to zero components on both transitions. So this is uh, the range of nice features and of, of favorable properties uh, of this euterbium uh, ion uh, that we use in our experiments. 
so without going into technical details, uh, the, just the ideas of the clocks and of the experiments we are running, we are working with ion traps that provide the localization and the long interaction times. We are working with laser cooling uh, so that we can get uh, operate these ions at a millikelvin temperature, getting rid of the uh, motional broadenings uh, due to the small temperature and the lamp thicker confinement. Um, we are driving uh, a single ion. We are observing the individual quantum jumps that happen each time the ion is excited to the metastable level. So we can get a very, very high uh, spectral resolution. Um, but of course, a relatively strong quantum projection noise resulting from the fact that we are just working with a single particle and that we are doing state measurements on a single ion. So the technique that is suitable for very narrow lines, very good control of assist all systematic frequency shifts, uh, and so especially suited uh, for this ion, and of course also for other ions for high precision optical clocks. So we are attempting to test the Einstein equivalence principle. I don't have to explain this to, um, to this audience. Um, so we are looking at the aspects of, uh, of local Lorentz invariance that is the orientation independence of the experiments and local position invariance with the aspects of um, uh, looking for time dependences and looking for dependences on other parameters like the gravitational potential uh, where the clocks are located. And the experiments we perform uh, are frequency comparisons. So we uh, expect that our atomic clocks represent the uh, 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 unperturbed atomic transition frequencies and we compare them in different settings in different times or under slightly different uh, experimental conditions. So this um, is a picture of the uh, laboratory where the measurements take place. It is the so-called clock hall at PTB in, uh, in Braunschweig. It is a uh, about 200 square meters laboratory space that you see here. Um, over the years, nevertheless, uh, it became uh, quite strongly populated. Mm -hmm. You see on the right side here uh, two cesium fountain clocks, CSF1 and CSF2, which are the primary frequency standards and primary clocks uh, for Germany. And uh, the larger portion of the picture here, you can see now a total of five iterbium plus uh, ion trap and optical clock setups representing really different generations of this of this clock. So starting with the oldest one, one and two and three. Uh, and then the newest additions to this ensemble of clocks is one that was built in cooperation with industry in order to have an autonomous um, uh, optical clock called OptiClock. And uh, our most recent uh, experimental system is one where we have where we are trapping ytterbium and strontium ions together for an improved control of some systematics. But I will speak now about uh, comparisons mainly of the two oldest uh, uh, clocks, ytterbium one and two, and uh, comparing them against the cesium fountains uh, for measurements of the absolute uh, transition frequencies. So the um, uh, first experiment we did in 2017 was uh, to compare these two generations of single ion clocks on the uh, octopole transition of Italian Plus. So this was uh, data taking over a long, uh, about the six months um, periods. We operated both clocks on the same transition, but you can see already from the picture of the of the pole traps that are used here that the two uh, setups are quite different. So we did this on purpose in order to have a good control of uh, possible systematic uh, effects or to exclude that we would uh, um, run into some common mode uh, rejection that both clocks would show a similar uh, mistake. So we try to make the systems as independent as possible. Um, and then we operated them for an extended period of time for a total of more than 1000 uh, uh, hours covering over a period covering more than, uh, than four months. The um, overall agreement between the two clocks was was very nice. So you can see it. You can see it here. The overall average of the two uh, realized frequencies had a relative difference in the low 10 minus 18 range, uh, fully consistent with the estimated uncertainty budget 
uh, for this transition. Here you can see the uh, statistical uncertainty, the instability of this frequency comparison, how it averages down. So it took about a, a measuring time of, of about 10 days in order to reach this low 10 to the minus 18 range of statistical uncertainty uh, and where the statistical uncertainty is largely dominated by the quantum projection noise. And we took this long data set also uh, in order to be sensitive to uh, effects related uh, to Earth's rotation, uh, the daily uh, rotation of Earth and also to the motion of, of Earth around the sun in order to analyze uh, these data in a test of, of local Lorentz invariance following uh, the standard model extension uh, by Kosteletsky uh, and Alf about uh, possible violations of Lorentz invariance in the electron sector. Um, so the idea here is to compare two, uh, two bound electrons and to check if their dispersion relation is isotropic in space or if there is an inhomogeneous potential like trapping the electron in a box asking is a dispersion relation really identical if this box is oriented or does it have a preferential orientation uh, with respect to, um, to some preferred direction in space or otherwise the term uh, is there uh, maybe a orientation dependence of, uh, of, the, of C for the, for the electron. And uh, instead of these containers, the, the inhomogeneous containers that we used are the uh, quite asymmetric uh, elongated uh, wave functions of the electron in the F, in the F state. Um, and um, so we compared the frequency of the two clock transitions for different orientations of the quantization axis. And we compared the frequencies from the spherically symmetric as ground state to this elongated F state. And then any violation of Lorentz invariance would show up as a frequency a difference between these two differently oriented clock states. And we were looking if there was a, any modulation of this frequency difference uh, with the Earth's rotation, that is, if there would be a dependence of the frequency difference on sidereal day. We could include this, uh, exclude this from the experimental data and improve the, the limits uh, on uh, Lorentz violations by two orders of magnitude. Uh, with respect to this experiment that was performed in the group of Hartmut Hefner in, uh, uh, in, in Berkeley uh, five years ago. Um, so this was for the octopole to octopole um, comparison of, um, of the same mm -hmm. uh, frequency in two different clocks. And then we compared uh, also the different transitions. So we operate the two um, uh, the two traps, now one on the quadrupole, the other on the octopole transition, we could um, swap the functions of the trap and we could also uh, employ one trap for both clocks, so in an interleaved fashion. So again, we try to make the experiments flexible in order to, uh, to be uh, sensitive really to different uh, possible experimental effects. Here we show the uh, uh, evaluation of the data set covering about five years. And this is now the ratio of the octopole over the quadrupole uh, frequency. Uh, you can see a nicely consistent uh, data set over, uh, over the years. Uh, and now we analyzed uh, this in terms of um, we, we tried, to, of course, to, de, to evaluate this number, which has a total uncertainty of about 3 and 10 to the minus 17, which is uh, limited by the largely limited by the systematic uncertainty of the quadrupole uh, transition. And then we analyze uh, this data set in terms of violations of, uh, of local position invariance. So the question here is there a time dependence of, uh, of, the, of the ratio. So the dotted line here is a linear fit. Uh, and then we can ask how does it relate to the fine structure constant. Now the uh, sensitivities uh, of these two transitions are known uh, from up initio uh, atomic structure calculations. The sensitivity factor is about plus one for the quadrupole and minus six for the octopole. So the frequency ratio would show a sensitivity of, uh, of seven minus seven uh, or an enhancement of seven times in the relative change uh, for a change of, of alpha. And so from this analysis, we uh, could uh, uh, provide a new limit for relative changes of alpha in the present book. And it has now a one sigma uncertainty 
of one in 10 to the minus 18 uh, per year. Uh, it has improved uh, an improvement over, over previous limits. Um, this is uh, the result that we, that we published earlier this year. Uh, we added one more point uh, this uh, spring, which again is nicely, is nicely consistent. So I can give you a slightly updated uh, uh, number about a 20% uh, reduction and now entering the 10 to the minus 19 per year range for the uh, sensitivity to changes of, uh, of alpha. Um, this plot shows the historic uh, evolution of uh, uh, how these uh, uncertainty in the laboratory tests of clocks uh, for changes of alpha has, e has evolved. You can see on a logarithmic scale a roughly linear uh, improvement over time reflecting the improvement of the uh, uncertainty in the, in the optical clocks. For a long time, the mercury aluminum uh, ratio uh, provided by NIST was a dominant uh, input uh, to the field. It was slightly improved then by uh, the addition of ytterbium data at NPL and in our lab. And now the uh, purely ytterbium data evaluation here is about a factor 20 improvement on the, uh, on the uncertainty. Um, so this was the search for the uh, for the long term drift, and then we also analyzed uh, the data in terms of an annual variation. So you can see here the same data set, uh, and now fitted uh, the sinusoidal curve that reflects the um, uh, annual change, the annual variation of the gravitational potential of the sun uh, at the Earth due to the slightly uh, elliptic orbit of Earth. And so we, we fitted this sinusoid to the, uh, to the data and you can see a marginally uh, significant amplitude here. And from this, we can uh, deduce a number on the, on the relative coupling of alpha to the gravitational potential with an uncertainty of about one in 10 to the minus eight over, over C square. Uh, and this improves previous uh, limit uh, that was a combined analysis of several uh, experiments by about one order of magnitude. Um, at the same time, we did uh, further comparisons of the um, ytterbium octopole clock uh, against the cesium clocks for absolute frequency measurements. Uh, so here I'm showing an even longer data set. So starting from 2010, we did uh, some long-term average measurements over longer intervals. And about in 2017, we started uh, to take data more, uh, more frequently. And uh, so from this data, uh, we can now provide uh, the uh, transition frequency of the octopole measured in terms of the SI second with a total uh, uncertainty of 1.3 10 to the minus 16, uh, which I think presently constitutes the most accurate uh, determination of an, of an optical transition frequency. The uncertainty here is largely determined by the uh, system by the total uncertainty of the C of the primary cesium fountain, and since we had two fountains available for this experiment in our lab, we could, at the long averaging time, we could provide this low uncertainty. Um, now we um, also analyze this data as a test of uh, of LPI. Uh, so you can see again here the uh, the fit uh, that looks for for a linear drift. Um, and the analysis here is now uh, aiming at changes of, uh, of mu, the proton to electron mass ratio. And this comes because the cesium hyperfine transition is, is also changes, is also sensitive to changes in the uh, cesium, um, sorry, I should point here, in the cesium magnetic moment. And uh, so in a simple model, it is sensitive to the, to the proton mass. Of course, in addition, it is sensitive to alpha, but here we take uh, the, the, uh, the more stringent limit on the constancy of alpha from the optical frequency ratio. And then there is a small contribution from a strong interaction parameter, which we take from an analysis of, uh, of rubidium to uh, cesium hyperfine structure that was performed in Paris. And so taking these uh, input uh, together, we can um, improve uh, uh, on, if we can obtain a limit on the temporal variation of the proton to electron mass ratio with an uncertainty of about 310 to the minus 17 per year. So it's about an order of magnitude less stringent than for, than for alpha. And, uh, represents an about a factor of two improvement over this uh, analysis uh, on the on strontium, cesium, and uh, other uh, clocks that was published uh, uh, last year. 
Um, and then we did, uh, of course, a similar analysis as, as I have presented for the uh, optical ratio uh, on the dependency, on the possible dependency on the gravitational uh, potential. Oops, no, sorry, I was. Um, so uh, I'm just showing the final, the final result here. So this is the the number we obtain on the uh, on the possible coupling of the proton to electron mass, mass ratio to the gravitational potential. Um, again, the value is consistent with uh, with zero, and uh, uh, present we present here a slight improvement uh, over this analysis of the of an ensemble of uh, of clocks. Um, so this is the um, essential part of the of the data I wanted to uh, present, and of course during um, I've spoken about he year long measurement campaigns. At the same time, we have also been thinking and improving uh, the experimental setup. So I can point to the future uh, that we will uh, continue on improved experiments. I'm showing here a picture of, of the next generation uh, of ion trap that we uh, plan to use for the iterbium experiments. Uh, we uh, uh, hope to obtain still further improved control of systematic uh, effects, hoping to reach the 10 to the minus 19 uh, relative um, uncertainty range with this setup. Um, we are also working on a uh, on a trap setup where we are combining iterbium plus and uh, and strontium plus, and this is for the evaluation of the black body radiation shifts, as well as the uh, atomic polarizability, uh, which is very precisely known for strontium, and by coupling these two ions, or, or more precisely known for strontium than for iterbium. And so by coupling these two ions in one trap, we can make comparative uh, measurements of, uh, of light shift in the two systems, and we um, hope to improve the iterbium uncertainty here by a factor of 10 for this black body shift contribution. So it will be, it will help to reach this, uh, this low uncertainty. And we also are working, of course, together with the colleagues on PDB campus, uh, with the Strontium Metas clock, for example, uh, where we can try to uh, combine these two clocks benefiting from the improved, from the higher stability of the optical lattice clock, improving the stability on the single ion clock. Uh, and we will hear today also in this session on the on the uh, highly charged uh, uh, iron work that is in, in operation at PDB. And so I, I think there is nice prospects uh, for frequency comparisons in a larger ensemble uh, of clocks uh, uh, locally. Okay, this brings me to my uh, to my summary. I have uh, presented data on frequency comparisons between optical clocks in the two reference transitions in. Uh, in iterbium and with uh, cesium fountains for absolute frequency measurements, we have found uh, agreement uh, of the two uh, ion clocks in the low 10 minus 18 range. Uh, we have presented an accurate uh, frequency measurement of the optical transition frequency, and we have performed various tests uh, in searches of new physics, improving on uh, limits for possible violations of Lorentz invariance and position invariance. Uh, we have not seen any new physics, uh, but um, so uh, of course uh, we have prospects for continuing the search at maybe higher sensitivity. And in any case, I mean, for us as a natural and national metrology institute, uh, the benefit in any case is that we have uh, improved uh, the clocks and our understanding of the clocks. So I'd like to uh, conclude by uh, thanking my co-workers uh, uh, in the teams of the of the Eterbium clocks, the cesium clocks. Uh, like typical for the COVID times, I cannot show you an up-to-date group picture, but I'm happy to show you the the picture of uh, of three of the heroes of the of the Eterbium experiments. Richard Lange, who has just defended his PhD thesis on the subject uh, last week. Uh, and um, and Niels Huntemann, the working group leader, and uh, and uh, Christian Sanner, uh, who has worked uh, uh, has very much largely contributed to the Lorentz invariance experiment. And the three, I'm very happy that the three uh, were winners of the Helmholtz Award uh, um, uh, last year. Then we have the nice cooperation with the cesium uh, team, and also very fruitful. Uh, cooperation with Siri, uh, Mariana, and uh, and colleagues. And with this, I'd like to conclude and thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Eka, for the very nice talk. Uh, we have ample time for questions. Um, well, if uh, I don't see any questions, um, uh, for Eka, these are these very impressive data sets. Uh, have you considered the possibility of extending your analyses to look for uh, oscillating dark matter? It's basically like a like an LPI test, except your frequency of oscillation is an unknown parameter, uh, and the phase, I guess, is also unknown. Uh, have you is it part of your plans to consider these analyses to look for, for example, uh, linear and fine interactions, uh, quadratic and fine interactions of a scalar dark matter field? Yes, we have started. Uh, we have started to look at uh, at, uh, at oscillating effects. Also, mm -hmm. um, I have. Uh, I think it was all already at the last meeting where I presented some preliminary data from a data set of uh, of ytterbium against strontium. Mm -hmm. We had preferred to do this experiment with uh, with strontium with a strontium metal clock because of the higher uh, signal to noise ratio and uh, and higher short term stability that would allow to uh, to investigate uh, also the, the, the shorter frequencies uh, for the single ion experiments that i've presented today of course we are always limited by the relatively uh, small short term stability um, but we have uh, lots of uh, so i i'm i'm not prepared to to present any new data uh, on this um, but we are definitely interested in the um, in the subject. We have long data uh, sets, um, and uh, and we will certainly also um, uh, look at, at further analysis. We could also uh, try to analysis, of course, against the against the solid state cavities. Um, and um, yeah, so I suggest also with you we stay in touch and look if there is interesting uh, material to analyze. I hope so. We may find some. We may contribute some interesting material. It would be very interesting, yes, because uh, it's you have very impressive optical to optical comparisons, but also I'm not sure if you're aware, uh, in the case of the interaction of a scalar field with the electron, uh, there are very few, basically no limits in that case. And something like an optical to hyperfine comparison with the terbium ion to cesium uh, would automatically basically put, uh, place the best limits if nothing is found in that case for a wide range of parameters because nobody is actually done the type of search of before. So, uh, so there is the opportunity to make a very big improvement in sensitivity or, or comparison with little effort because you already have the data, basically. Okay, so very interesting. We will look at it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, oh, uh, Will McGrew has a question. Uh, do you have a protocol in mind for using the strontium lattice clock to improve the instability of the turbine ion? Oh yes, um, right. So the I, I didn't I didn't mention any uh, any details. Uh, yeah. So one uh, um, the our our colleagues uh, uh, Uwe Steyr, Christian Listert, working on the on the strontium clocks here at PTB have actually uh, progressed in this direction uh, already. So one scenario would be to combine the two clocks at different uh, at different Ramsey times and to. Uh, um, and to look at it and to compare basically phase advance on, uh, uh, on on the two systems and in this way to to uh, obtain a correction uh, on the on the slower system from the faster system that could be one uh, that could be one scenario here. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, I don't see any further questions. Uh, let's thank uh, Eckhart again. And our next talk is by Sander Vermolen from uh, Cardiff at the moment. Uh, so Sander, if you'd like to share your slides, please. Yes, I would uh, turn on the full laser pointer thing as well full screen up. Does that work? Can you see my slide in the laser pointer? 
guess uh, I can see a slides and laser pointer uh, whenever you're ready, please. All right. First of all, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to talk here. I'll be presenting our uh, our work on setting some uh, some limits on scalar field dark matter using a gravitational wave detector for the first time. Um, and we've done this work with our small team here at Cardiff University, where I'm doing my PhD currently, and that is in collaboration with the, uh, the people at uh, the Geo 600 gravitational wave detector in, in Germany. So first of all, let me just run you through the, uh, the outline of the argument and the results I'll be presenting. Uh, I'll first be talking about how you might detect variations of the fundamental constants with interferometers. After all, that is the, the theme of this, of this session, the variation of fundamental constants. And I will argue how you can detect those with interferometers. Uh, then we'll make it a bit more specific and say why those fundamental constants would be varying. And in this case, we will be talking about scalar field dark matter and how it makes these fundamental constants vary and then how we detect those, could detect those variations with interferometers. And then, then we use, use that principle to, uh, to take the, uh, the data from the Geo 600 gravitational wave interferometer to, to set some constraints on the scalar field dark matter. And I will conclude uh, with telling you a bit about what I think is, is the, the great potential for using this experimental methodology in the future to set, to set constraints on dark matter and, and maybe some other things. Right, first of all, uh, I will make the argument that I think many of you are, are quite familiar with, but nonetheless, it is quite central to, to the methodology that we demonstrate here. And that is the observation that changes of the fine structure constant and the electron mass will cause changes of the size and refractive index of solids. Um, it's fairly straightforward. Of course, the size of a solid depends on the atomic bore radius. If you have a solid, it's simply a lattice of, of atoms with some electrons around it. And the, the lattice spacing is given by the atomic bore radius. And that atomic bore radius we know from, from fundamental quantum mechanics is given by the products, the inverse products of the, of the electron mass and the fine structure constant. Uh, so if this gets larger or smaller, uh, your lattice spacing gets larger or smaller and the size of your solids will change as a result, where the concept of proportionality that I omitted here is, of course, the number of lattice spacings. The argument is, is slightly uh, more involved when we consider the change of the refractive index, uh, but here you can quite simply see it when you consider a Lorentz model for, for electromagnetic refraction in solids, and you will see that the refractive index depends inversely on the resonance frequency of the electrons in the solids and that resonance frequency of the electrons is uh, proportional again to a to a combination of the electron mass and the fine structure constant in the universe that is uh, so then if you look at adiabatic changes and you you evaluate the fractional changes you will find that the size changes are proportional to the fractional changes in the fine structure constant and electron mass likewise the refractive index changes are proportional to this linear combination of the uh, of the fine structure constant and electron mass changes where this concept of proportionality depends on the wavelength that you consider and the uh, and the refractive index so I'll tell you in a minute which one uh, which wavelength and refractive index we are considering here so then it's just schematically just to drive the point home superfluously you have a solid and then you change the fundamental constants and the solid will get slightly larger and the refractive index of the solid will change. Uh, so now I will talk about how you might detect this with an interferometer. I'm sure many of you would, would understand that you could probably build an interferometric experiment to detect size and refractive index changes. But what I am arguing here is that any existing Michelson interferometer does have a sensitivity to this phenomenology. Uh, so I have here a diagram of a very simple Michelson interferometer. Light comes in here, is split out the beam splitter, goes into the two arms, returns, recombines, and goes out to the output port of the uh, of the interferometer. Um, now there are first of all some refractive solids here uh, that should should be subject to the uh, phenomenology I just discussed. Uh, for now, we will look at the beam splitter, and the beam splitter is an interesting one because it imposes into the uh, into the interferometer already an inherent asymmetry. Because interferometers, as you may know, are only sensitive to a difference in the optical path length between the two arms, uh, so therefore you are only sensitive to to anti-symmetric changes in those arm lengths. And the beam splitter. Many people don't realize this. It has a finite thickness. It's not infinitely thin, and it has two distinct surfaces. One of them 
is the splitting and recombination service has a reflectivity of 50% and the back service is, is anti-reflective coating and, uh, and has no, no reflection practically. So that, that beam splitter introduces an asymmetry. And this asymmetry really is the root cause of how we may detect the variation of these fundamental constants in any Michelson interferometer. Because in the presence of these, of these changes of the fundamental constants, we look at our beam splitter, it gets slightly larger and the refractive index changes. And what happens is that this reflecting surface, this beam splitter surface that splits and recombines the light in the two arms gets shifted slightly uh, in the X direction. So because of this, the X arm of the interferometer gets, gets a bit bigger by this much and on this side as well. And if the refractive index changes in addition to that, that, that bit of extra optical path length also occurs at a, at a different index of refraction. The result is that you find uh, a differential optical path left in the signal in your, in your output due to these changes that is proportional to the changes of both the, uh, the size and the index of refraction of your beam splitter. So that's, that's, that's the main principle of how we detect these, these uh, changes. Now, up till now, I've only been talking about, uh, about let's say, adiabatic changes of, the, uh, of these constants. Uh, but of course, for an interferometer, we mostly consider the frequency domain. These interferometers are mostly sensitive to oscillating signals. So we have to consider the frequency domain. Uh, and when we are considering the frequency domain, we look at the frequency response of our probe, which is the beam splitter. And there are then two main resonances or two main behaviors to consider for that beam splitter. So here I have drawn a very generic uh, driven harmonic oscillator re resonance curve. It's normalized to the resonance frequency. And for a beam splitter, there are two main resonances that we have to consider in this respect. Uh, one is the, the fundamental mechanical oscillation frequency, which is at a relatively low frequency. This is, this is, by the way, this is of course related to the material that you use and the size of your beam splitter. Most beam splitters in interferometers have a beam splitter with a thickness on the order of centimeters and are made of fused silica. Um, and then you find that the fundamental mechanical resonance frequency of the, of the thickness mode, let's say, is on the order of 10 to the 5. Uh, so that is mainly the, th the thickness effect that we have to consider. And then there is the, the changes of the index of refraction where we have to consider the electronic resonances uh, of, the, of the electrons as they are in fused silica. And there the, the main resonance is uh, the band gap is uh, around 10 to the 15 hertz. So that's, that's quite a large gap between those two main resonances. Uh, and as a consequence of, of that, um, of this frequency dependence, this frequency response of the beam splitter, uh, to these oscillating uh, alpha and, and, and electron mass, uh, the, the effect on the output signal of an interferometer when you're considering these size and refractive index changes is highest at, at low frequencies, highest at frequencies that are below this mechanical resonance frequency because then the beam splitter can optimally respond to being driven in these size changes and refractive index changes. Uh, you can go to somewhat higher frequency uh, and go between these two resonances. And there you are above this mechanical resonance. So the, the size changes then produce a subdominant signal. And then the refractive index uh, changes are the thing that give you your main signal. And that is in this regime where you are between the mechanical resonance frequency and the electronic resonance frequency. But this, this just shows that this is quite a broadband sensitivity because these resonances are so far apart. And if you are below them, and um, you have you have pretty good sensitivity. Uh, of course, what is missing from this argument is the inherent sensitivity of an interferometer, uh, which which is determined by the noise characteristics of the apparatus. But that's that's a different story. We will consider that later. Right. So now we are going to make the argument a bit more specific. Now we are going to uh, apply this phenomenology to to a source that could produce such such changes in the uh, in the index of refraction and the size of the, of the beam splitter. Um, and we are considering uh, the, the, the sub-EV scalar field dark matter models, uh, which have gotten quite a lot of attention. We've heard about them in, in great detail and during this session as well. So I will go over it very soon, but just here's a, here's a num enumeration of, of the many names that this type of dark matter is known by wisp wolf There are dilatons, there are moduli, there are relaxions, and they're all forms of scalar field dark matter. And basically, the, the main hypothesis that all of these encompass is that the, the phenomena we observe and we have called dark matter 
can be explained by proposing the existence of uh, an undiscovered field within the paradigm of quantum field theory uh, or a particle, uh, and that is described by, by a scalar field. So most of these models propose that the scalar field dark matter is produced in the early universe by something uh, like a misalignment mechanism and will then manifest in the current day as an oscillating field where the uh, oscillation frequency is given by the Compton frequency, uh, which is simply simply the mass of the uh, of the new field in, in uh, natural units, and the uh, the amplitude of the of the oscillating field is given by the local density of the field, and there are numerous assumptions possible for this uh, for this local uh, local density of the dark matter. Uh, one of the simplest ones is of course to say that that you simply take the uh, the local galactic halo dark matter density about 0.4 giga electron volt per, per cubic centimeter. <coughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, so then you have this, this oscillating undiscovered scalar field. Um, and then many models say that, well, if you have this type of, of scalar field, it will become trapped and then verialized in gravitational potential wells of, for example, our galaxy. Uh, you could have it trapped in some other gravitational potential wells. For example, you could have it trapped locally in the Earth's gravitational potential well or that of the sun. Uh, you'll see more about that later. But anyway, this scalar field will become trapped and will then verialize or thermalize uh, very much like a gas in this gravitational potential well. And that has an important consequence uh, because this verialization limits the coherence of this oscillating field. Uh, whereas there is this Compton frequency, which gives you, let's say, the central frequency of oscillation. If you have some verialization, this thermalization, your dark matter field gains uh, a finite spectral line width in the frequency domain. So here I have a, a plot which shows this on the x-axis, there is the frequency or equivalently the kinetic energy distribution. And if you have this verialized dark matter, there is a, a finite line width to this frequency domain uh, signal. And then here, the, the line width that you have for uh, galactic dark matter, which is of course a very popular model, is, is 10 to the minus six of the frequency, which is rather narrow, but, but significant as you will see later. Right, uh, then of course you have this very nice, uh, this nice model where you are explaining the dark matter by the existence of, of the scalar field uh, that has not been discovered yet. And then of course the relevant question that you ask as an experimentalist is, it, is uh, can we test it? Can we see this, this scalar field and can we somehow falsify your theory? And luckily, most of these theories do come with an additional assumption that uh, allows them to be tested, that produces some testable consequences. And that is, of course, the assumption that this field couples to the standard model. Uh, and these couplings, there are many different options, uh, arguably the simplest one, and therefore the one that we consider are linear interactions with the photon and the electron field. Uh, so those interactions are manifested by adding some terms to the standard model Lagrangian. Uh, you parameterize them by an energy scale. Uh, phi here is, a, is, of course, our scalar field. You parameterize them by a coupling parameter, and that is an energy scale both for the, the photon field and the, and the electron field. And as I said, other, other couplings are possible for, for different scenarios. Uh, and then it is relatively straightforward to, to show that within the context of the standard model, if you add such terms to the interaction Lagrangian, you will produce changes in the fine structure constant and electron mass. Right. Um, well, given, given, given that phenomenology, given the fact that scalar dark matter would produce these, these changes in the fine structure constant, as we have seen before, uh, these changes in the fine structure constant and electron mass will produce size changes of our beam splitter. This produces a differential optical path length in the interferometer and that produces at the output of our interferometer an observable signal in theory. Um, now then the question comes, which interferometer can we use to probe this signal? And many people would immediately say, well, the most sensitive interferometers we have are the, the LIGO, Virgo and, and CAGRA gravitational wave interferometers. So you should use those. Um, but the, the reality is a bit more complicated as it tends to be, uh, because this is this, the actual situation for, for the LIGO interferometers. They have an additional piece of glass, an additional mirror in the arms, and they form Fabry-Perot cavities in the arms. And these Fabry-Perot cavities 
in the arms give those interferometers uh, very high strain sensitivity. So the change of arm length divided by the arm length. However, because this signal, unlike a gravitational wave, does not produce a strain in the arms, it produces a differential phase at the beam splitter. These LIGO Virgo Kagra uh, interferometers actually have lower sensitivity compared to the uh, what was originally the Pathfinder for most of the new LIGO technology, which is a GEO 600 interferometer, which does not have these mirrors, but has a much higher phase sensitivity. Uh, that much higher phase sensitivity at GEO is also in a large part due to the, uh, the quantum squeezing that, that they employ at that interferometer. In fact, they have the world record in, in using quantum squeeze states of light at, at six decibels. And this gives uh, this, this interferometer uh, the highest sensitivity to this type of signal. Right. Uh, so then we can do a little recap of the theory and uh, the experimental consequences thereof. Um, so now we know that the scalar field dark matter changes the index of refraction and the size of our beam splitter and that this, this field oscillates, uh, we have an expectation for what type of signal we should see if this field were to exist. It's of course, what we are always going for, a quantitative prediction. And in this case, we have an oscillating signal with an amplitude that is determined by the dark matter coupling parameter. This is a free parameter of the theory by the properties of the beam splitter that we are using in our interferometer. And uh, the amplitude is also depends quite strongly on the abundance of dark matter. And that, of course, is also a free parameter of the theory. Uh, and the mass is as well. And then we have the very important part that this signal oscillates at a frequency set by the mass of the field. And this oscillation has a finite spectral line width, or equivalently, a finite coherence time. Um, and this, this part, as it turns out, is, is something that causes a, quite a major challenge in these experimental searches. And I will now show you how we, how we address this. Uh, so first of all, here I have a plot of what a virialized dark matter signal looks like in the time domain. Uh, so what you can see here is basically uh, an, a quickly oscillating carrier at the Compton frequency. And then there is an envelope of that oscillating signal, which varies much more slowly on a time scale equal to the coherence time. Um, and of course, the problem that you may encounter is if you take a very short measurement, uh, let's say you take a measurement at a random time here that is very short compared to the uh, coherence time, you will see an amplitude of that dark matter signal, uh, which is quite a bit lower than if you would have performed the same very short measurement here. Um, so if you take short measurements of such a virialized signal, such a thermal signal, where the phase of the oscillation varies stochastically as predicted by this thermalization, and then you run into problems in measuring the amplitude or equivalently in the absence of detection when you have rule out these signals uh, in assuming what sort of amplitude you would have been able to detect. And there's some details in this, this paper came out recently where they point this out and say that some, some current constraints actually fail to take this into account. Um, so the way that we have met this challenge in our data analysis is by employing a, a type of custom spectral analysis where we actually tune our frequency bin width in our spectrum to the, to the line width of the dark matter. Um, essentially, what we do is we still do a, a reasonably normal Fourier transform, but we take the length of the Fourier transform equal to the coherence length uh, of, the, of the, the, the expected coherence length of the dark matter signal at every frequency of interest. And this gives you a spectrum where the bin width is equal to this spectral line width of the dark matter. And that, in theory, gives you the, uh, the maximum possible SNR. Um, yeah, let me just skip forward here. This is a schematic overview of how that works. So you, you cut your data into, into segments, then you perform Fourier transforms on more of them, and you average over these different segments. And then in theory, you should get the maximum SNR. To show you how that works, I have two plots here where we have simulated dark matter signals with these spectral characteristics. And we have done spectral analysis where we vary the length of our Fourier transforms, or equivalently, we vary the, uh, the bin width. The bin width is, of course, one over the length of the Fourier transform. And here on the left, you see that you can recover the amplitude of your stochastic signal uh, faithfully for four times uh, that, are, that are quite short. 
Um, the reason that this is not more noisy, as you may expect, is that we average over a great number of different data segments. And here you see another problem occurring with, with doing spectral analysis on this type of signal. If you take your Fourier transform length that too long compared to the coherence time, if you go more than order of magnitude over the coherence time, the recovered amplitude of the dark matter signal actually goes down because you are going out of coherence with your dark matter signal. And here you simply see yeah. Andy, you have 10 minutes to go, 10 minutes. All right, thank you very much. And here you see uh, the, the equivalent uh, of how that occurs for the SNR, where of course the only, the only new phenomenology you see on the right-hand side here is the scaling down of Gaussian noise with increasing uh, length of your Fourier transform and the scaling down of the, of the standard deviation. The, to check, by the way, in red, uh, that is a monochromatic sine wave and it behaves as expected for, uh, for Fourier transform, those in the recovered amplitude is constant here, and here it slowly comes up and then at some point it saturates. So this is just to show that with our spectral analysis technique, uh, we, we bypass these, these challenges associated with the finite coherence time, and we're able to get an optimal SNR if we go to this point where the frequency bins we choose are for all frequencies equal to the line width of the, uh, of the dark matter signal that we suppose exists. Right. So then uh, what you create in the end is, is an amplitude spectrum where, where we have this, this, this nice feature that we have the bin widths equal to the uh, supposed line width. Uh, and what you can then do is start to look for potential dark matter signals. And the way you do that is by estimating the noise parameters uh, of, your, of your spectrum. And the way we have done that is by, for every frequency bin, we look at the neighboring bins and using those neighboring bins under the assumption uh, that the, the bins are mostly dominated by Gaussian noise, we can determine where the, uh, the, the expectation value and the, uh, and the standard deviation of the underlying noise distribution is. And then, of course, uh, we, can, we can set uh, set a cutoff at a certain confidence level based on those estimated statistics. And then anything that is above that uh, confidence level uh, is not caused by the, uh, the underlying Gaussian noise at, a certain, certain, at that confidence level. Uh, that leaves you, of course, with the problem that you have quite a number of peaks here in this spectrum uh, that you are uh, confident are not produced by noise, um, but of course, it is quite unlikely as well that these are all caused by dark matter. Now, some of these are quite well known uh, from the from the uh, from the uh, Geo 600 interferometer. For example, uh, these peaks in this harmonic series are caused by the suspension of the mirrors. These are known as violin modes, but that still leaves quite a large number of of, of peaks uh, that we have to check uh, to see if they are perhaps dark matter. So that is what we have done. Uh, Specifically, what we have done is for, for every peak, we have checked whether it is persistent and whether it is stable in frequency, because that is what you would expect from a, from a genuine dark matter signal is that it is stable over time and that it is persistent. So what we have done is we've taken several data sets spread out over the course of, of roughly two years. Uh, we created spectra uh, from all of them, and then we have overlapped those spectra. So here you see an example. We have a spectrum, let's say, from December and a spectrum from June. And uh, there are some peaks in it. Uh, for example, these two peaks, we see that in June there was this peak here, and in December the peak was there, and they are not in the same place. Now, if this peak or this peak would have been caused by dark matter, uh, they should have been in the same place, and they should have been there always so we can discount this peak as, as being due to dark matter. This one, however, overlaps perfectly in time and amplitude. So this is one that we should, uh, we should keep in mind as a potential dark matter signal and we cannot, cannot uh, remove it straight away. As it turns out, uh, doing this uh, with, with these, these many different data sets that we had access to, we were able to reject 99% of the peaks uh, because we saw that they shifted in frequency. Uh, over time, uh, which is not something that is consistent with dark matter. And we were left with 14 candidate signals that were entirely persistent in time. Uh, so then with these 14 candidate signals, we subjected those to, uh, to follow-up analysis, uh, where, for example, we checked uh, whether the, the width 
of these peaks was consistent with dark matter and whether the coherence time of these signals uh, was consistent with dark matter. And the answer for all of those 14 peaks was no, no, those peaks are likely not caused by dark matter because they are in their characteristics um, in these terms are inconsistent with what the theory predicts for a real dark matter signal. So then uh, what we can do is, is ruling out that any of these signals are caused by dark matter is so that we can set constraints on the, on the parameter space that, that, that is given by this sensitivity that we attain with the GEO 600 interferometer. And we have done so. And to make these constraints a bit more specific, we have interpreted uh, our, our results in the, in the context of three different uh, scalar field dark matter models. So the first one we consider is, is a basic scalar field dark matter model where we just have this, uh, this coupling to, the, uh, to the, uh, the electron and the, and the photon. And we assume that the, uh, the dark matter density is simply given by the galactic halo dark matter density. And you see that we, we set a constraint here uh, for both the electron and the photon. And for the electron, we in fact, we beat the fifth force constraints here in, in black. The, the colored regions are all other experimental constraints. Second scenario we consider are uh, the dilaton and moduli forms of scalar field dark matter. Those are distinct in that they uh, have other couplings to the standard model fields. Uh, importantly, they have a coupling to the gluon fields that is, that is dominant compared to the other couplings. And that means that that, that scenario is subject to more constraints from fifth force experiments. So here, even though we beat all the experimental searches by, by several orders of magnitude, in this scenario, we are not better than this, these fifth force equivalence principle constraints, um, but still very, very competitive. Uh, and then the final scenario we considered is, is the so-called relaxion halo dark matter scenario is re relatively new, uh, where essentially these couplings to the uh, electron and, and photon field arise through coupling uh, uh, of the Higgs boson. And in addition, the, the hypothesis is that these, these relaxions could form bound objects where the, uh, uh, the extent of these bound objects is, is determined by whether they're captured by the sun or captured by the earth. Um, and, and whether they're captured by the sun or captured by the earth is determined by the mass of the field. And the, the experimental consequence of this is that there should be large overdensities uh, on, near the earth and uh, that we can probe. Um, and then taking this into account, taking into account that you now suppose that the local dark matter density is given by this mass distribution, uh, you can set some, some, some novel constraints for this scenario as well. And here we see that our constraints in green here uh, coincide with, with this large overdensity. So that means that we can actually be very, very sensitive to this type of dark matter and, and beat the, uh, the force constraints by quite a significant margin. Um, yeah, uh, how much time do I have left, Evgeny? Uh, you have a couple of minutes left. A couple of minutes. Right, uh, then I'll briefly, briefly discuss the outlook. Um, so I think this, this, this technique has now been demonstrated and uh, that we can use it to set constraints on scalar field dark matter. And there's a lot of potential to use this, this technique in future uh, because interferometers, just based on their size and characteristics, uh, have a different sensitive frequency range. And we have seen that the, the different sensitive frequency ranges correspond to different mass ranges. So what we may be able to do is use different interferometers with different frequency sensitivities to set constraints in different mass ranges and, and get a very broadband constraint on the parameter space. Of course, there's always the possibility to get higher sensitivities out of your interferometers. Uh, potentially quantum squeezing of light uh, that is being being driven further and further lately uh, will allow much higher sensitivities and we can set tighter constraints. Um, but there are also very simple modifications that we might be able to make with existing interferometers to get tighter constraints. For example, we could use slightly different end mirror thicknesses um, to be more sensitive to this dark matter. Here it is schematically represented how that would work if you use a different uh, end mirror thickness here compared to here. Now the size changes of the end mirrors where before they were common mode are now differential mode to the interferometer because this, this size change is bigger than that one. And this gives you quite a, a much larger signal. So this could be employed in, in some, some new interferometers, maybe, maybe some of the space-borne ones uh, that are currently being planned.
Um, yeah, then just uh, just to uh, to bring some attention to what we are currently doing in Cardiff, uh, we are building some some co-located interferometers that we can use for for correlated interferometry. And those those interferometers are primarily built to look for a quantization of space time. But we we suspect that we will also have quite a nice sensitivity due to this form of scalar field dark matter. And of course, because you are doing correlated interferometry, uh, you have you have a much larger coherence time, practically infinite. Uh, so therefore, you can integrate in time and get these constraints uh, better and better. Uh, all right. With that, I will conclude and leave you with the uh, the constraints that we have set on scalar field dark matter. Thank you, Sander, for the very nice talk. Are there any questions? Ah, oh, yes, uh, Ariel, please. Okay, uh, essentially the question I want to ask about the pseudo-scalar coupling. Can you apply the same technique for, let's say, fields like axion-like fields for pseudo-scalars? Um, I think, I think in principle, in principle you can, um, but the sensitivity, as I understand it, is, is no longer very competitive uh, for, for this type of interferometry coupling. And can you explain why? What is the fundamental uh, principle which does not allow you to uh, apply the same technique for pseudo scalars? Um, What's the fundamental problem. Maybe, maybe I could answer the question. Um, uh, a pseudo scalar has to couple either to un, uh, unpolarized spins or to a polarized photon uh, beam. So it is possible to modify the experiments by using polarized photons, uh, which are not actually used, for example, in GEO 600. Uh, so there have been proposals uh, that it is possible to be sensitive to a pseudoscalar photon coupling. Uh, and I'd be very happy to send you the papers if you're interested. Mm -hmm. okay. it, it is possible to do it. It just needs a modification of the experiments. Uh, but this particular type of search is not sensitive to the pseudoscalar photon coupling. Okay, thank you. And another question, why do you have so narrow uh, actually constraints uh, on the level uh, from 10 to minus 13 EV to 10 to minus nine or 11? So can you extend this region of sensitivity? That's a very good question. The, the main, the main uh, frequency domain or mass domain that we are sensitive to is determined by the interferometer. Uh, so the interferometer, uh, we consider it actually quite a broadband device, uh, but the, the sensitive frequency range of an interferometer is limited at the low frequency, let's say around 50 hertz, uh, by, by what we call seismic noise. So that is where we have oscillations of the Earth itself and environmental disturbances coupling into the interferometer, and this greatly limits our our, uh, our frequency stability. So this sensitivity at the low end really goes up rather steeply due to this seismic noise. Uh, at the high frequency end for our interferometers, um, the noise contribution we are limited by is, is quantum noise, uh, which goes up uh, not very quickly, but it does, does go up quite significantly. Uh, at this point, this is photon photon shot noise. Uh, the main technical limitation that cuts off the GEO 600 sensitivity at the high frequency at about 8 kilohertz is, is simply the electronics. Uh, you are sampling your signal at a certain frequency uh, with your, your uh, uh, digital analog to digital converters. For the GEO 600, this is at 16 kilohertz. So then you have a Nyquist frequency for your spectral analysis of 8 kilohertz. If you were to use digitization electronics with a higher sampling frequency, uh, you will, of course, have a higher higher uh, frequency reach and a higher mass reach equivalently, but you still have to face this uh, this quantum shot noise, which also scales uh, with higher frequencies. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, if not, uh, let's thank Sander again, and uh, 
Our next speaker is uh, Stephen Kane from ATB. Uh, Stephen, if you'd like to share your slides, please. Okay, how's that? Oh, perfect. Uh, whenever you're ready. Okay. Uh, let me just uh, minimize this here. Okay, so uh, thanks you, Kenny, and uh, thanks to yourself and Victor for giving me the opportunity to present the work that we're doing at uh, PTB, where we're developing a very different type of optical atomic clock based on highly charged atomic ions, which can then be used as uh, frequency standards or to perform precision tests of fundamental physics. I'd like to begin by uh, introducing our group. So the common theme between all of our projects is the application of quantum logic spectroscopy. And this is a technique that allows us to perform cutting edge optical spectroscopy on species that are not compatible with standard uh, techniques. This includes optical clock candidates like aluminum plus, molecular ions, and highly charged ions. And each of these species has applications uh, ranging from relativistic geodesy to tests of fundamental physics. We additionally have a project developing novel optical clock techniques uh, using large numbers of calcium ions, which uses effects such as entanglement and dynamic decoupling to improve the measurement stability. I'll begin by introducing why highly charged uh, ions are interesting candidates for clocks and for searches for physics beyond the standard model. I'll then uh, introduce our experiment and then show some uh, data from the operation of the system as an optical atomic clock, along with an analysis of some of the major systematic shifts associated with our system. I'll then uh, discuss the experimental upgrades that we're in the process of implementing in order to perform uh, precision measurements of isotope shifts in highly charged ions, and close by giving a brief summary and outlook as to what we'll be doing in the lab in the coming months. So as we all know, the improvements of optical clocks over the last decade has been extremely fast. And in the, last, uh, in the late 2000s, they began to display uh, levels of stability and ultimately accuracy that were uh, superior to their microwave counterparts. In fact, this graph is in dire need of an update, as we now have our first data point that's off the bottom of this graph, where the group at NIST in Boulder were able to achieve a systematic uncertainty below one part in 10 to the 18. And I believe we'll hear a bit more about the system in the next talk. The question now is, can we push this graph down even further to even lower levels of systematic uncertainty? Of course, the existing systems continue to improve year after year with ever more amazing control of external electric and magnetic fields, their gradients, and characterization of the shift coefficients. But in parallel to this, we can search for species that are intrinsically less sensitive to these kinds of fields. One option is uh, nuclear clocks, as mentioned earlier by Mariana, and highly charged ions are another potential candidate. As we remove more and more electrons from an atom, the remaining electrons get more and more tightly bound. And this leads to the electric dipole transitions being shifted from the optical range to the extreme ultraviolet and even X-ray parts of the spectrum. This then greatly reduces the differential polarizability of the two states involved in the clock transition for optical and infrared radiation, which comes from, for example, lasers or uh, black body radiation, which are two major contributors to the error budget of state-of-the-art optical clocks. Additionally, highly charged ions are one of only a few choices for future XUV or X-ray clocks, as this kind of radiation would be ionizing for singly charged and neutral atoms. But if we've moved all of our usual optical and infrared transitions into the XUV range, where do we find optical transitions on which to do our spectroscopy? Well, the first place we can look is a fine structure transitions. And as an example here, we've got um, argon 13 plus, which is our proof of principle ion that we're using here. Uh, this has five electrons. So it's got a boron-like electronic structure, which is characterized by a strong electric dipole allowed transition in neutral boron at 250 nanometers. And in argon 13 plus, this is, as we discussed on the previous slide, shifted all the way to 19 nanometers. And then we have a ground state fine structure transition, which in neutral boron has a wavelength of about half a millimeter. But in argon 13 plus, this is shifted all the way to 441 nanometers, which is right in the ideal place for precision laser spectroscopy. Additionally, we can look for level crossings between states with very different character. So these kind of level crossings arise because uh, neutral atoms have their orbitals ordered in the Madelung ordering, where, for example, the 4s orbital has dropped down below the 3d orbital. But in a hydrogen-like system, we then are ordered uh, only by principal quantum number. So therefore, at some kind of intermediate uh, charge state, uh, these levels must cross. And um, here's an example using um, samarium-like ions, so with 62 electrons, which comes from a paper from Julian Berengut. And what we see is that the energies of the uh, 4f and 5s orbitals 
um, cross at a nuclear charge of 77, which corresponds to iridium. And this is one of the reasons why iridium has been proposed as a potential highly charged ion clock uh, candidate. Highly charged ions, like all atomic clocks, can also be used for precision tests of fundamental physics. So if there's any non-gravitational coupling of dark matter to normal matter, we would see changes in the apparent values of the fundamental constants. So if we treat dark matter as a scalar field, like we've uh, heard uh, just now, then our motion uh, through, for example, rotation of the Earth or our orbit around the Sun would lead to periodic modulation of the apparent values of the constants. So here we'll use the final structure constant as an example. And the energies of different atomic transitions depend differently on the value of the fine structure constant, with the amplification factor here, k, corresponding to the amplification of any change in alpha. And this is what we heard then from Vladimir on uh, Tuesday. And then if we compare the values of uh, the transition frequencies for two different uh, transitions over time, we can then place any uh, limits on any present day uh, variation of the fine structure constant. So this has been performed uh, successfully over the last two decades, as Eckhart uh, showed in his talk as well. And we'll add down to the point where we have uh, a limit of about 10 to the minus 18 per year, or even better now uh, with, with the latest data from the Ethereum system. So um, the reason that we use Ethereum for this is that the octopole transition has the highest known sensitivity factor K um, of any currently operational optical clock. The advantage of highly charged ions here, as uh, we saw in Mariana's talk, is that the sensitivity factors for certain species, such as Iridium 17 plus or, or California, can be up to two orders of magnitude larger. And this enables us to place competitive limits on any variation in alpha, first of all, in shorter uh, measurement uh, times. And secondly, if we can control our systematics at the same level as state-of-the-art optical clocks, we would uh, actually be able to place even more stringent uh, limits on any variation. Furthermore, we can use atomic clocks to search for such things as a potential fifth force. Uh, we've already heard about this uh, this week on Monday, um, so I'll try to keep this brief. Um, normally, we separate out the isotope shift into uh, two uh, terms, which um, we refer to as the, uh, the mass shift and the field shift. And each of these terms have a term that depends on the atom or the element involved, and a term that depends on the isotope involved. So here, in terms of the mass shift, you have the mass shift constant and uh, the isotope masses. Um, when um, analyzing data uh, from this, we actually have a large experimental error relatively in the uh, mean nuclear charge radius. Um, so therefore we make linear combinations of uh, two transitions in order to remove the sensitivity to uh, the, the charge radius. And then when we plot uh, these modified isotope shifts against one another for various different isotope pairs, we produce what's known as a king plot, uh, which uh, for the expression shown here should then, uh, the data point should lie along a straight line. However, if there's any de deviation from linearity, this could um, point to a previously unknown uh, coupling between, for example, electrons and neutrons, um, which, yeah, uh, which is, uh, could be uh, described as a potential new fifth force. Um, however, higher order effects within the standard model already also introduce nonlinearity, such as the um, quadratic mass shift or the second order field shift. And this could then mask the signal from new physics. Uh, additionally, once we get down to placing very, very tight limits, um, we end up uh, potentially being limited by the experimental uncertainties on the isotope masses. Uh, these effects can be removed by adding more transitions into the analysis, and this is uh, referred to as a generalized King uh, analysis. So charged ions are a rich source of potential uh, additional uh, narrow optical transitions that we could use. As an example here, we show that uh, highly charged calcium in charge states between 11 plus and 16 plus possesses electric dipole forbidden transitions that we could combine with existing data in order to suppress the standard model effects and other experimental uncertainties. So why highly charged uh, calcium in particular? Well, it's the lightest element that has four stable isotopes without nuclear spin. No nuclear spin is an advantage because we don't want to have to correct for hyperfine structure. Calcium 48 is also effectively stable, which then gives us five possible isotopes or four isotope pairs in total. The fact that it's light means that the contributions from the next to leading terms in the isotope shift from the, within the standard model are smaller than in heavier uh, atoms. So in principle, new particle contributions should be easier to resolve. Calcium plus has two uh, clock transitions that have been used, uh, measured previously by uh, Knollman and Solaro and their colleagues um, uh, to uh, place uh, limits on any potential uh, fifth force. The problem here is that they are both S to D transitions, so they've got fairly uh, similar character, and this leads to some 
uh, common mode cancellation of any potential signal. We could compare against an S to P transition, uh, for example, but this is electric dipole allowed, which then naturally leads to much lower levels of precision and accuracy. Additionally, singly charged and neutral uh, calcium have quite a lot of electrons, which makes uh, precision atomic calculations quite difficult. But as we showed on the previous slide, highly charged calcium gives us a few different additional options that are very different in character to the calcium plus transitions. In the case of calcium 14 plus, it's a P to P transition. So this is a carbon leg system with only six electrons, which makes it a bit more calculable than uh, singly ionized calcium. An interesting coincidence is that the clock transition in calcium 15 plus is very close to the second harmonic of the transition in calcium 14 plus. So in principle, we could measure it with the same laser with an additional frequency doubling stage. So where would our measurements compare to what has come before? So the current best limit on a new boson um, using uh, measurements in calcium comes from the transitions I, I mentioned on the previous slide, um, which leads to this exclusion plots where we plot the, uh, the mass of the hypothetical new uh, particle against its coupling to electrons and neutrons. If we were able to measure the calcium 15 plus clock transition with the same level of uncertainty as the D to D transition was measured here, um, which is a uncertainty of about 20 hertz, which is quite a conservative estimate, we should be able to improve on this limit by around three orders of magnitude. Better measurements of the S to D transitions and the calcium 15 plus transitions could uh, in principle improve this limit even further. And in principle, there's nothing stopping us making um, measurements with uncertainties with uh, sub hertz levels of accuracy. So if highly charged ions are ideal for these kind of tests, why has no one done it up until now? Well, as Vladimir mentioned on Tuesday, progress with high flight ions was slow for quite a long time, um, which led to an absence of uh, high accuracy frequency data. And this came mainly from experimental issues with the production and storage of the highly charged ions, uh, which makes them incompatible with ultra high accuracy clock techniques. But I hope that in combination with uh, Mariana's talk earlier, I can convince you that the experimental barriers have now all been overcome. And it really now is all systems go for highly charged ion based clocks. We need a significant amount of energy to remove so many electrons from an atom, so it can't be done by simple photoionization, as is the case for singly charged ions. Instead, we use an impact from a, an electron beam with energies in the kilo electron volt range in a device called an electron beam ion trap, or EBIT. This produces a hot plasma with a temperature in the megakelvin range, which is then stored by a combination of the electron beam and electrostatic electrodes. The electron impact excites the highly charged ions to higher states, from which they then decay, emitting light that we can observe on a spectrograph. The features are Doppler broadened to the gigahertz level by the megakelvin uh, level ion temperature, and they're systematically shifted due to the Tesla level magnetic fields. Therefore, if we want to perform spectroscopy at the level of optical atomic clocks, we have to get the highly charged ions out of the EBIT and transfer them to an environment that is much better controlled. So let's take a look at how we achieve this. Our experiment is split into two rooms. On the left side of the dividing wall in the middle here, we have what we refer to as our machine room, which is where we keep all of our noisy, heavy equipment that we don't really want disturbing the laser lab. This includes our electron beam ion trap, which is our source of our highly charged ions. Uh, we can extract the highly charged ions from the EBIT and launch them into this deceleration beam line, where, where they separate out based on their charge to mass ratio and also are uh, decelerated. We then transfer them to a cryogenic linear pole trap, um, which is uh, cooled to a temperature of four Kelvin, by a pulse tube cryocooler, which is itself located again in the machine room and connected to the trap region by a series of extra high thermal conductivity uh, copper links with various different stages of vibration decoupling. Um, we need this cryogenic environment because uh, highly charged ions are extremely susceptible to charge exchange collisions. To get a storage time on the order of an hour means that we need to maintain a, a vacuum level of around 10 to the minus 14 millibar. The highly charged ion is then uh, trapped in our pull trap together with a single ion of beryllium. The beryllium ion is there because the argon 13 plus ion doesn't itself possess a laser cooling transition, but the coupling of the ions via the Coulomb interaction leads to common modes of motion between the two ions. Therefore, laser cooling of the beryllium leads to sympathetic cooling of the argon ion. Using quantum logic, we were then able to demonstrate the first ever coherent manipulation of a highly charged ion. On the left, we can see a narrow laser frequency scan over one of the six Zeeman components of the uh, ground state fine structure transition in the argon 13 plus ion. In the middle, we can see that we can uh, drive coherent Rabi oscillations between the two states uh, of the clock transition. And we can also make uh, measurements of various different atomic parameters, such as the lifetime of the excited state or the G factor of the excited state. 
Um, to operate as an atomic clock, we have to acquire frequency data for long periods of time, days, weeks, and months. So therefore, we need to actively lock the clock laser to the atomic transition. And um, because argon 13 plus does not possess a clock transition that's insensitive to magnetic fields of first order, we then therefore must use lines that are themselves first order sensitive, but by combining uh, data from two lines with equal and opposite sensitivity, we can cancel this out to first order. In fact, we actually lock to four lines simultaneously, which allows us to average uh, out not just the linear Zeeman shift, but also the electric quadrupole shift caused by the electric quadrupole moment of the excited state. By looking at the Allen deviation of the uh, locked clock laser frequency as a measure of the system stability, we can see that at long times, the frequencies of the individual lines start to drift away, um, depending on their G factor, which is due to instability of our applied magnetic field. However, the mean frequency continues to average down with the stability roughly as three parts in 10 to the 14 per root tau, where the measurement time tau is in seconds, which is about 20 Hertz so one second. And this is done, uh, we achieve this when we use around 100 Hertz for the transition line widths. Now, this is not competitive with the most advanced optical clocks in the world, but this is limited by the relatively short excited state lifetime in argon 13 plus. In the future, we could achieve much better levels of stability by choosing a highly charged ion with a much longer excited state lifetime. Uh, nevertheless, we can see that our originally targeted uncertainty of one hertz is reached after an averaging time of only around 10 minutes. Um, and in fact, we can average down below this and we, uh, our target uncertainty at the end will be about 0.1 hertz or equivalent to about two parts in 10 to the 16 on the optical frequency. And we should reach this after about 11 hours of measurement. So one problem associated with the sympathetic laser cooling is that its efficiency depends heavily on how well the charge to mass ratios of the two ions are matched. In our case, where we use beryllium and argon 13 plus, the mismatch is so great that the ions can move almost independently in the radial directions of the trap, as we can see here in these two animations. The very low amplitude of the beryllium ion in the second mode of motion shown here means that the time constant for Doppler cooling becomes unacceptably long for an optical clock apparatus, and in fact, it's on the order of seconds. We therefore developed an algorithmic uh, cooling technique that allows much more efficient cooling of these modes. The basic principle is that we coherently transfer phonons from this problematic radial mode into an axial mode of the crystal via a series of uh, quantum logic pulses. And once the excitation has been transferred to the axial mode, it can be then very easily cooled using the beryllium ion. So we can see this by observing the motional sidebands of the clock transition on the argon ion. We see that before cooling, we see that the ion is very close to the Doppler limit of three phonons, uh, which we can see from the relatively small asymmetry between the red sidebands of the uh, clock transition and the blue sidebands. But after a few cycles of algorithmic cooling, we see that the red sidebands are uh, almost completely suppressed, implying that the mode is close to the motional ground state. We reach motional phonon numbers of less than 0.5 in both modes, which is equivalent to a temperature of less than 200 microkelvin above the zero point energy. And this makes this the coldest highly charged ion ever produced in the lab, and arguably the coldest highly charged ion ever to exist. So now that we've demonstrated that it's possible to cool all of the relevant motional modes of the ion crystal, we must turn our attention to anomalous heating of the ions due to electric field noise in the trap. Uh, and this is a problem because we can't apply active cooling to the radial modes during the clock interrogation. Therefore, a low heating rate is essential to maintain low motional amplitudes and therefore small systematic shifts to do with time dilation from the uh, ion uh, thermal temperature. For highly charged ions, the issue of electric field noise is even more of a problem because the heating rate scales with the square of the charge state of the ion. We measured uh, the heating rate of all four uh, radial modes of the ion crystal. Two of them are associated with the beryllium ion and two with the highly charged ion. And we measure heating rates uh, between 0.3 and 10 phonons per second. Now, this is fairly typical levels of heating for macroscopic ion traps. But when we consider that uh, argon 13 plus is two orders of magnitude more sensitive than singly charged ions, this actually corresponds to the lowest level of electric field noise ever reported in a radio frequency ion trap. And in fact, if we convert this to a heating rate for a single charged calcium ion, it's equivalent to the heat a heating of one phonon every minute and a half. Combined with the uh, algorithmic cooling that we showed previously, this allows us to suppress the uh, uncertainty of the systematic shift due to the ion temperature below the 10 to the minus 18 level. So here's a brief summary of some of the other main systematic shifts that we must consider for a clock based on argon 13 plus. Um, in addition to the shift that I've already uh, mentioned, as with all ion-based clocks, we must consider the time dilation due to excess micromotion. Unfortunately, it seems that we have uncompensatable micromotion directed along our trap axis, which might be caused by imperfections in our trap assembly. However, the magnitude of the shift is below the 10 to the minus 15 level, 
and by frequent measurements, we should be able to suppress the uncertainty to the 10 to the minus 16 level or actually below. This will be improved in the future by a replacement of the iron trap and does not pose a fundamental limitation to the accuracy of a highly charged iron based clock. As the clock transition in argon 13 plus's magnetic dipole allowed, we also have to consider an AC Zeeman shift from the clock laser. Again, this shift is specific to the case of argon 13 plus uh, due to the M1 character. Um, as highly charged ions are very sensitive to stray electric fields, it's possible that the ion could slowly drift in the trap, which would lead to a first order Doppler shift. We deal with this by alternating our clock interrogation between two counterpropagating directions. Um, the quadrupole shift and the linear Zeeman shift I've already mentioned. We also have a quadratic Zeeman shift um, caused by the applied magnetic field, but under our operating field of around 20 microtesla, this shift is actually below the 10 to the minus 19 level. And again, the shift. Was... You have, uh, 10 minutes to go. 10, oh. 10 minutes. Thank you. And then the shift from the secular temperature I've already uh, mentioned, we uh, suppress this using algorithmic cooling uh, to below the 10 to the minus 18 level. So this is how uh, our measurement then fits into the history of argon 13 plus frequency measurements, uh, as Mariana uh, already showed. So until the mid 2000s, the spectroscopy was mostly performed directly in EBITs and led to an uncertainty of little under part per million. And in 2019, the group of Sven Sturm were able to improve this to around nine parts per billion. But by using a cold iron in a linear pull truck, we hope to be able to bring this down to the 10 to the minus 16 level, which is an improvement of nearly eight orders of magnitude over the state of the art. So now I'll just give a quick overview of the work that we're doing, setting up for measurements of isotope shifts. We'll start by measuring the frequency of the clock transition in argon 36, 13 plus. All of the data that I've showed up until now has been with argon 40, 13 plus. In our system, switching to loading argon 36 into the EBIT is as simple as changing a gas bottle. And what we see here is a time of flight spectrum for the highly charged ions in the electrodynamic beamline, where the ions separate out based on their charge to mass ratio. And what we can see is that um, when switching from the argon 40 to the argon 36 bottle, we see a different time of flight spectrum, uh, showing that we can in fact load and extract the new isotope from our EBIT. And in fact, we've also already succeeded in retrapping this isotope in the pull trap ready for spectroscopy. Uh, to switch to highly charged calcium requires more substantial changes to the EBIT as it must be loaded from a solid sample rather than from a gas bottle. The device shown here attaches to the side of the EBIT. The holder at the front here has five apertures, each of which contains a different isotope of calcium. The, me the metal is vaporized and loaded into the EBIT via pulse laser ablation. Loading a different isotope then is as simple as rotating the, uh, the holder here. We've already demonstrated loading of calcium 40 into an EBIT uh, located with our colleagues in Heidelberg, and we plan to install this at PTV later this year. So to summarize, uh, highly charged ions are uh, excellent systems for tests of fundamental physics uh, and as potential optical atomic clocks. We were able to demonstrate optical clock-like operation using the tools of quantum logic. We're now able to cool all of the relevant modes of the highly charged ion to the ground state, including these problematic radial modes using algorithmic cooling. And our results show that a highly charged ion based clock with systematic uncertainty below 10 to the minus 18 is possible. We're currently setting up for an absolute frequency measurement targeting subhertz levels of accuracy, or inaccuracy, which would level, uh, represent an improvement of nearly eight orders of magnitude over previous work. Over the next few months, we'll finalize our analysis of the systematic shifts in order to produce a comprehensive error budget. We'll then repeat our frequency measurements with argon 36 before switching over to uh, measure the isotope shift in uh, calcium isotopes in order to search for nonlinearities in the generalized king plot. So I'd like to close by thanking the great team who have worked uh, closely together on the project over the years, including uh, two of our students, uh, Tobias Leopold and, uh, and uh, Peter Micker, who have now moved on uh, to uh, DLR and to uh, CERN, and uh, to our uh, close collaborators in uh, the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics with the group led by Jose Crespo, uh, the theory group of Andrei Sechikov here at the PTB, and the group of Uwe Ster, who have provided us with access to the cryogenic silicon resonator to stabilize our clock laser. And thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you very much for the nice talk, Stephen. Are there any questions?
Uh, well, I, I don't see any questions. Uh, so in that case, uh, let's thank Stephen again. And uh, our next talk uh, and final talk for, for our session is by uh, Will McGrew. Uh, if you'd like to share your slides, please, Will. Uh, can everyone see this? Uh, yes, perfect. Uh, we can see your slides and your, your pointer. Perfect. Well, whenever you're ready. Okay. Uh, well, uh, first up, I'd just like to thank the uh, Marcel Grossman meeting for inviting me to uh, give this talk. I'm Will McGrew. I work with the group of Andrew Ludlow on the Atterbium Optical Lattice Clock Experiment at NIST in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, and I'm very excited to tell you about a uh, new technique that we've been developing called zero dead time differential spectroscopy beyond the laser coherence limit. And this work was uh, in collaboration with the aluminum plus ion clock group at NIST and uh, also with the optical frequency comb group. Quick outline of my talk. First, I will go over uh, a little bit about clocks and their uses as tests of fundamental physics. Then I'll proceed to talk about differential spectroscopy. Uh, and from there, I will uh, talk about a um, new twist that we put on differential spectroscopy, which we're calling zero dead time differential spectroscopy. First, clocks and tests of fundamental physics. Now, whenever I'm explaining my research to a friend, inevitably the first question that gets asked is why bother? Why bother to build better clocks? And it really is a fair question to ask. Uh, when, when viewed on sort of human time scales, the instability that has been obtained by state-of-the-art cesium microwave clocks is uh, almost incomprehensible. And so it seems a uh, little, little motivated to continue to develop the next generation of clocks, which are based upon an optical transition. However, uh, I think that there is great motivation for continuing to build better clocks. And the reason is basically because if you look at the units that define the SI system of measure, uh, the, the unit that can be realized with the greatest precision by many orders of magnitude is the unit of time and frequency, second or hertz. And as such, measurements of time and frequency represent a uniquely powerful lens with which to view the natural world. This can be seen through a number of interesting applications, um, but one that's maybe particularly salient for this audience would be uh, tests of certain models of dark matter. Uh, and what I'm going to describe here is a proposal that was originally put forward in this physical review D. Uh, and I won't spend too much time of it with it because I think uh, Mariana did a, a very nice job earlier in this session. But essentially, uh, what we have is we have a dark matter wave, which is ultralight and can be approximated as uh, simply a, a sinusoidal uh, oscillation. And uh, this dark matter wave will perturb the clock uh, in, uh, in, a, in a way which changes the transition frequency of the clock. However, of course, we can't measure anything if we've only got a single clock uh, because we need something to compare it to. So we need two clocks. And importantly, they have to be different clocks. You can't have two atterbium clocks. You need to have actually different clocks with a different sensitivity to this phenomenon. Um, and so by simply measuring the frequency ratio between the clocks, you can constrain uh, the coupling of this hypothesized dark matter wave to, um, to the clock frequency. Uh, this has some very interesting uh, qualities, these measurements do. For one thing, they're highly local, uh, where many uh, constraints on dark matter might be based on astrophysical phenomenon. These really do probe at a, a level that's uh, perhaps separated by tens of meters, or uh, at most, maybe hundreds of kilometers. They also have extraordinary precision, uh, generally better than 10 to minus 16 in fractional frequency. And uh, then also the bandwidth of this measurement is limited by the cycle time of the clock. And as such, you have sensitivity to uh, roughly uh, particles with a frequency of about Hertz or below, which corresponds to roughly 10 to minus 15 EB or below. 
Now we have uh, done some of this analysis on a previous comparison. Uh, this was published earlier this year and uh, we compared our terbium optical lattice clock to the aluminum ion clock at NIST and also the strontium optical lattice clock uh, at Jilla. And using those comparisons, we were able to uh, bound the possible coupling constant as a function of dark matter particle mass or frequency of the, the particle. Uh, and that's shown in blue here. Okay, but we want to continue to improve our clocks, decrease the instability, improve our constraints of ultralight dark matter. So clock instability is limited by a number of effects. Uh, there's the Dick effect, which is a technical biasing phenomenon, though I'm not going to talk about that much in this talk. Um, and other sources of noise contribute uh, according to this equation. Uh, sigma of tau is the inverse of the signal to noise ratio divided by the square root of the number of measurements. And the signal to noise can be uh, deteriorated by a number of technical effects, such as detection noise or photon shot noise. Uh, but really, the fundamental limit, at least for uncorrelated quantum systems, is quantum projection noise. Uh, you can reduce the other sources by technical improvements, but QPN uh, really does present a uh, less surmountable barrier. Okay, quantum projection noise essentially comes about due to the process of quantum measurement yourself itself. So if we uh, picture a quantum system, a two level quantum system as a qubit like this, uh, it can be pictured on the block sphere. And really this has an incredible amount of information intrinsic to the system. Uh, it's parameterized by phi and psi, which are real numbers. However, when you make a measurement onto it, it's projected onto a Boolean basis. You either get a measurement of zero or one out of it. And uh, this reduces the amount of information that you can get from a single measurement. Um, so essentially, uh, the signal to noise ratio is equal to F zero over delta F. And due to projection noise, delta P, which is the uh, fluctuations of the excitation ratio amounts to one half uh, at best. And uh, for Ramsey spectroscopy, the slope of frequency with respect to excitation ratio amounts to one upon T sub i. So again, plugging this into this simple formula, you get a uh, signal to noise ratio inverse of one over two pi T sub i F zero. And um, this argument is for a single oscillator uh, if you have uncorrelated oscillators, then uh, having n oscillators just reduces the signal to noise uh, ratio by a factor of root n, or reduces the inverse of the signal to noise ratio. Okay, uh, then the number of measurements is the measuring time divided by the cycle time. So from uh, these arguments, you have an equation which gives you the quantum projection noise. Uh, 1 over 2 pi F0 root N T sub I tau. And this is what we want to reduce. Okay, how do we decrease quantum projection noise? This is a pretty simple uh, formula and there's really only a few parameters we can vary on it. The one that might seem the most interesting at first glance would be to simply increase tau. Tau is the averaging time. So you just run the experiment for longer and you get a lower instability. Um, however, I'm, uh, I'd push back against that a little bit. And in fact, I think uh, that it can be useful to, instead of solving for sigma y, solve for tau instead. Uh, if you have a certain target instability that you wanna reach, uh, then this formula will tell you how long you have to average to reach that, uh, that instability. And uh, in a lot of ways, when you're actually running these experiments, you're more interested in the amount of time you need to run them than you are even in, in the instability itself. Okay, next up, we could increase F0, increase the operating frequency of the clock. This has historically been an immensely fruitful uh, avenue for decreasing quantum projection noise. And in fact, this is largely the motivation for why optical clocks have come to surpass um, uh, microwave clocks since the mid 2000s. Uh, this one upon F0 dependence means that the uh, five orders of magnitude difference between optical and microwave clocks 
makes uh, it possible to reach instabilities, which would be unattainable in microwave clocks. However, uh, now that we've made that switch from microwave to optical, uh, it's somewhat challenging to increase F0 more. Uh, you basically got the uh, clock you've got, and you've got the transition frequency that you've got. Next up, we might be interested in increasing the number of uh, quantum oscillators, which are present in our experiment. Can we increase n? Uh, well, there are essentially there are two major types of optical clocks. There are ion clocks and neutral atom clocks. Uh, neutral atom clocks generally loaded into an optical lattice uh, can operate with an n of thousands or even tens of thousands. Uh, and this is allowed by the fact that there is a very weak interaction between neutral atom clocks. However, there's a much stronger interaction between ions uh, trapped in a, an atomic trap. And uh, the coupling between the ions has made it difficult to operate with as many ions as uh, you can operate with, uh, with neutral atom clocks. And in fact, so far, ion clocks have been constrained to n equals 1. Uh, it will likely be possible to push that number up in the future, um, but uh, it seems uh, difficult to believe that it'll be possible to reach as, as high of numbers as for neutral atom clocks. However, I'd like to emphasize that ion clocks, despite this kind of um, this difficulty of having an intrinsically higher quantum projection noise, uh, ion clocks have been able to attain really exemplary systematic uncertainties. Uh, for instance, on the right here, we have some work by our colleagues in the Aluminum Plus group at NIST, and uh, they attained a total uncertainty below 10 to minus 18. Um, so th there's really incredible work being done, uh, but this quantum projective projection noise limit does uh, remain a significant hurdle. Uh, and then furthermore, certain ion clocks, especially the YB plus E3 transition, have uh, the highest sensitivities of uh, currently uh, current current clocks in development, uh, and uh, so they're really useful as tests of fundamental physics. Okay, and just to to bring out this comparison between lattice clocks and ion clocks a little bit further, this plot is from our uh, Bacon collaboration measurement between two optical lattice clocks, the terbium and strontium, and the ion clock aluminum plus, and as you can see. The optical lattice clock, optical lattice clock comparison had a one second instability, which was uh, about a factor of four below that of the uh, comparisons, which included the ion clock. And this was limited almost entirely by quantum projection noise. Uh, as I mentioned before, sometimes it's useful to think in terms of averaging times rather than the one second instability. So if the aluminum plus YB or aluminum plus strontium comparisons wanted to reach a target instability of 1 times 10 to the minus 18. At the level shown here, it would require 20 days of continuous comparison to reach that level, uh, which is uh, possible, but certainly onerous. Here on this plot, I have uh, the one second instability of interspecies clock comparisons. I don't have every interspecies clock comparison, but this does include uh, most of the lowest instability comparisons. And uh, one thing to point out is that all of the measurements in the 10 to minus 16 decade at a second have been optical lattice clock comparisons. Okay, so that is uh, some of the challenge, which is uh, wrapped up in increasing N, uh, especially for ion clocks. Um, but there's one more parameter that we can vary, which is to increase the interrogation time increase T sub i. Now, the thing that limits interrogation time is something that's known as the coherence limit. And uh, this comes about very simply because uh, you do your first Ramsey pulse and then the phase between the optical local oscillator and the atom evolves uh, freely as a function of time. And if that phase is allowed to wander outside of the so-called inversion regime, negative pi by two to pi by two, radians in phase, uh, you reach a regime in which you can no longer unambiguously read out the phase of the laser. So for instance, if the OLO atom phase were to wander outside of the inversion regime, you would make a projective measurement and you couldn't be sure that what you were, you were, you were measuring was positive pi by four radians or three pi by four radians. 
And so this limits how long of an interrogation you can perform. What can we do to improve this? One thing we can do is to increase the stability of the OLO. Uh, this has, and I'm very confident, will continue to attract an enormous amount of uh, research interest in the next years. Um, and so for instance, uh, our colleagues at, at uh, Jilla and PTB have uh, really been trailblazing in designing cryogenic systems with unprecedented instabilities. However, we're starting to get to the point where some of these OLOs have a complexity which is comparable to the atomic system itself. And so it really is interesting to try to find ways to uh, use our existing OLOs and try to use them in uh, more sophisticated ways, allowing us to interrogate longer without increasing the complexity of the OLO system itself. And uh, in my next part, I will talk about one uh, method of doing that, which is differential spectroscopy. Now, there are a number of novel interrogation schemes which have been proposed and demonstrated over the past several years, motivated by a desire <clears throat> to, um, to extend interrogation for these reasons. Uh, for instance, you can use one or several sy atomic systems to pre-stabilize and extend interrogation on another. You can also use a uh, special interrogation protocol, dynamical decoupling, to extend interrogation, uh, non-destructive measurements to achieve a phase lock, and correlation spectroscopy. However, for our point of departure, we took a proposal that Dave Hume and Dave Librant uh, put together a few years ago uh, for differential spectroscopy. The way this works is you take two systems, for instance, a lattice system and an ion clock system, you phase lock the optical local oscillators together and interrogate synchronously. Um, and the benefit of this is that since the clocks have different transition frequencies, the phase will accumulate differently on the two systems. So for instance, a terbium has a uh, transition frequency about twice as small as aluminum plus. So you might do an interrogation, which is short enough that ytterbium has not yet left the inversion regime, and it's still possible to unambiguously read out the OLO atom phase. Uh, so you can do that, you can read out the phase, and then you can send that as a correction on the aluminum plus optical local oscillator. And then this will discipline the optical local oscillator and bring the aluminum phase back within the inversion regime, allowing aluminum plus to make a measurement. Uh, without any phase ambiguity. And this, uh, this does require certain things. Uh, you need one of the clocks to have a higher signal to noise ratio than the other. So for instance, a terbium optical, local loss, uh, op optical lattice clock um, can read out the phase with greater precision. And also the high signal to noise clock needs to be lower in frequency than the other clock. Uh, and it's also strictly bounded that assuming a flicker frequency noise profile of the shared optical local oscillator, uh, you can only increase the interrogation time by a factor which is equal to the frequency ratio. For aluminum plus ytterbium, that's 2.16, which is a very nice improvement, um, but not one, but, but one that only has a, a very definite and uh, somewhat limited yield. So we uh, demonstrated this on our system. We found that we could operate at 500 millisecond spectroscopy and uh, provide a correction from a terbium, which kept aluminum plus in the inversion regime. And under those conditions, we uh, saw a one second instability of the aluminum plus clock amounting to 4.4 times 10 to the minus 16 per root tau. So this is an improvement of roughly a factor of three compared with our um, measurements during the, the Bacon collaboration. Okay, that's differential spectroscopy. However, we came to realize that there was a uh, different spin we could put on this protocol, which allowed even greater uh, uh, improvements to the instability of the system. Uh, this slide just introduces the notion of zero dead time spectroscopy. This is something that we uh, originally demonstrated for actually a, a very different motivation. Um, the Dick effect is the uh, technical biasing phenomenon, which uh, has to do with the time dependence of the sensitivity function 
and uh, we took our two systems, YB1 and YB2, and interrogated them in an interleaved fashion such that we were always looking at the OLO with one system or the other. And as such, we had a sensitivity function which was very nearly uniform in time and uh, could suppress the Dick effect. However, we came to realize that this general technique, uh, chaining the, the systems together in an interleaved fashion could be very naturally paired with differential spectroscopy as well. And uh, this slide explains how that works. Basically, we just run zero dead time spectroscopy, but after each measurement, we send a phase correction to uh, remove the accumulated phase wander on the aluminum 27 plus clock. And uh, the, the maximum duration we can do for each of these ytterbium cycles is bounded by the uh, coherence limit of ytterbium. However, there's uh, no real fundamental limit for how many of these we can chain together. Um, uh, well, you have 10 minutes to go, uh, 10 okay. minutes. Okay, okay. Uh, so uh, we uh, chain together a number of measurements and uh, here are the results of that. Uh, the orange points here represent the single clock differential spectroscopy measurements and then the blue points represent the uh, zero dead time differential spectroscopy results. And we found that we could effectively, at least out to uh, about four ytterbium cycles, we could uh, preserve coherence on the uh, aluminum plus Ramsey fringe and uh, extend interrogation. And we could uh, see roughly quantum projection noise limited performance out to four cycles of ytterbium interrogation, which amounts to about a 1.7 second spectroscopy time. And uh, under these conditions, we see a one second uh, fractional frequency instability of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 16 per root tau. This is an improvement of nearly an order of magnitude compared with our previous results from the Bacon collaboration. Previously, as I mentioned, the aluminum plus ytterbium ratio would require uh, 20 days to reach a level of one times 10 to the minus 18. However, with this factor of 10 improvement of uh, one second instability, factor of 100 improvement in averaging time, it now takes only seven hours. So it's possible to reach these levels during the course of a single day of measurement, which is, I think, quite exciting. All right, as I mentioned, we're no longer limited to an increase in interrogation time of the, the frequency ratio. So what continues to limit the instability? Uh, we believe, and we've carried out simulations which support this, that we're really only limited by technical effects. Uh, these include the magnetic field fluctuations on both clocks. Uh, magnetic field wander will um, cause issues with the ytterbium phase corrections as well as the uh, ability to cancel aluminum plus uh, phase wander. Uh, we also have uh, some modest limits due to phase noise cancellation instability and uh, at a somewhat lower level, the frequency transfer uncertainty through the comb for the OLO phase lock is still a concern. However, I'd like to emphasize that all of these are technical and subject to reduction. And uh, we, we are optimistic that uh, with further technical optimization of the system, it will be possible to extend interrogation to even longer times, potentially approaching the lifetime limit. Previously, I showed this plot, which gives the one second instability for interspecies clock comparisons. And uh, as you can see, this work now sets a, a new record, uh, to, to our knowledge, a, a new record for the one second instability, uh, which is achieved for interspecies clock comparisons. And also excitingly, uh, this is uh, the first time that an ion clock interspecies clock comparison has been within the 10 to minus 16 decade. And in fact, it's very close to one part in 10 to the 16. So uh, just to give a little bit of perspective on this, um, here's the plot I showed earlier, which gives the improved constraints on uh, ultra low mass dark matter, uh, the blue, uh, trace is the ytterbium strontium techniques. Uh, we have not yet extended this analysis to include the most recent measurements, but when we do that, we uh, will see roughly a factor of two improvement over these timescales compared with the ytterbium strontium numbers. 
And um, another thing I'd like to emphasize is that this zero dead time differential spectroscopy is really quite a generic technique. Um, differential spectroscopy itself has some limits. One, has to, one of the clocks has to be high signal to noise. There needs to be a high frequency ratio and so forth. But really, uh, zero dead time differential spectroscopy can be applied to almost any clock comparison, uh, as long as you are able to provide the corrections with one of the clocks. So uh, we've got constraints here for the ytterbium aluminum plus uh, ratio. But uh, for instance, uh, simply using the YB plus E3 transition clock, as Eckhard Peak talks about, um, would uh, potentially be able to decrease the constraint on this coupling constant by roughly a factor of 20 uh, with a, a similar instability to what we've demonstrated. And then, of course, as uh, Stephen King and Mariana talked about, um, using other clocks such as highly charged ions or thorium nuclear clocks could offer even better uh, orders of magnitude improvement. And this zero dead time differential spectroscopy technique should be applicable to almost any clock system. All right, and with that said, I'd like to thank you all for your attention, and I'd like to uh, thank my collaborators, uh, and especially the Aluminum Plus Ion Clock at NIST and the Frequency Comb team as well. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Will. Uh, are there any questions? I think all of the optical clock experimentalists already know all the details of each other's work. Uh, that's what it seems like. Uh, well, in that case, um, are there any general questions that um, uh, anyone may have for any of the other talks, perhaps? It, it looks like Eckhart almost has a question, but I, I'm not sure. Uh, no, no, I just switched on again to show that I'm that I'm still awake. <laughs> well, it, it's good to know. It is also late here, yes, but I am I'm, I'm also awake. Yes. Um, uh, so if there are no other questions, um, then I'd like to thank uh, Will again for the talk and all the speakers for the excellent talks. Um, so this is the last uh, day of our uh, session of this year's meeting. Uh, so uh, I have to ask Victor about whether we'll do a proceedings or not. I think we probably won't. Um, in that case, uh, it would be great if all the speakers could upload a copy of their slides to the Indica website. Uh, so to do that, I think uh, all that's needed is uh, just to log on to Indico with the uh, same password that you generated to have. Um, uh, actually, it is quite late here. Um, uh, basically, with the same password that you submitted your abstract with. Um, and it would be great, essentially, just to have a record and as a reference uh, for, for future reference. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, with that, I think we can close the session. So thank you very much for, for attending our sessions. And uh, I hope we can see you again in, well, three years time when the next Marcel Grossman meeting is on. And hopefully we can do it in person uh, because that is always much more exciting than, <clears throat> than online meetings. Thank you very much, Yekini, for putting this together. So it was, oh, it was, it was my pleasure. Uh, thank you. OK, so. Hey. Thank you all very much for a lovely session. Good to see you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.
Thank you. Bye-bye.